want to go and get a tea or coffee or go to the bathroom before we get started. They're just out the door, kitchen straight that way. There's bathrooms once you walk through the door to the right and to the left, so there's plenty of bathrooms for the breaks. Um, my name's Emma Sherry. I'm a senior lecturer at the Centre for Sport and Social Impact at La Trobe, so welcome to one of our campuses. And it's my job to help um, facilitate today. There's a spare, lucky last spare, that's the only one that's left. <laughs> Um, my job to help facilitate today. So people from the football community will be presenting you with all the information and I'll be just helping pull it together and basically keep the class organised. So thank you all for coming on a Sunday morning. It's an excellent turnout. We're very impressed and surprised. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for coming along. So I'm not quite sure why it's shutting down. It shouldn't be. Okay. So what we're going to do um, this morning is we're going to be talking, for starters, about um, player recruitment and retention, and Sal will be talking to you about that. We'll be using the whiteboard, um, we've got a document camera to record things as well if we need to. That'll go for about an hour or so. There'll be All of the sessions today will be encouraging question and answer, so please pop your hand up if you have a question or a comment. It's my job, though, to be Tony Jones Q&A style to keep you on track. So um, no 20-minute opinion pieces, please. We do have to keep churning through, but we do want discussion as much as possible. Um, at 11.30, we've got James Selby to come in and talk about Active After Schools program, so that'll be quite interesting. And then we'll be breaking for lunch. Lunch is provided today, and it will be out in the, um, the kitchen area there. If that's not to your liking, the big market's very conveniently across the road. You can go eat yourself a bratwurst or a whole heap of donuts. It's up to you. They're my two recommendations from the big market. 
Um, what I was going to ask, though, is it is a Sunday. We've, we've scheduled 45 minutes for lunch. At the lunch break, I'll be asking you if you want the full 45 minutes or if you'd like to keep it at half an hour and get out a little bit earlier. So we'll have that discussion just before the lunch break, but I'm guessing most people will say, yep, let's keep churning through. After the lunch break, um, Sal and I will be talking about female participation specifically. And then we'll have about half an hour before we finish off for the rest of the day um, to talk about what's in your folders, what's the next steps, any questions. Okay, so today's focus is really about getting players and keeping them. And then a special focus at the end on female participation. One final bit of um, housekeeping that I will say is please do, if you're busting to go to the loo, please go. <laughs> um, we're not going to make people sitting there jiggling. It's very distracting for us and for you. Um, can you please switch your phones off or silent? Um, unless you are a cardiac surgeon or your wife is in, in, about to give birth in the next 24 hours, um, please switch it off and keep it silent. You are allowed to answer them for leave the room if you really do have to take a call. Because um, again, we've got a lot to cram into a short day. The only other thing I will say is you'll notice that Sal has this lovely flashing thing around his neck. We have some people who are from the regions that couldn't come today, so the presentations are being recorded. If you ask a question, you'll notice that the presenter will repeat your question. That's so that the people listening back later um, will be able to understand what the question was that Sal's not going to be answering and they won't understand. So if you ask a question and he says, so the question was da 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 he's not going crazy on a Sunday morning, it's, uh, it's for the recording, okay? If I remember to do If that. he remembers to do it, I'll jump in and help him do it as well. Um, do we have any questions before we get started? We can indeed. And Harry, can we have another pack? We had about 80 people respond and we went, yeah, 80 aren't going to come and yeah, they have. So we're very excited. So I'm going to unmute the microphone so Sal will be a little bit louder now um, and we'll start our session. So please, full attention, any questions, hand up just so we can keep um, crowd control. Thanks very much, guys. Okay. I'm not sure I need a mic on Sicilian background, little out Italian growing up in an Italian family when mum's picking up the phone, not talking to someone, yelling like they're on the other side of the planet, but it's okay. Uh, look, I've got a loud voice, I'm sure everyone can hear me pretty clearly. If you can't, let me know up the back and I'll, I will raise it. It's pretty easy. Um, I have to echo Emma's comments and just utterly impressed by the turnout on a Sunday morning in October. Um, amazing, usually. Volunteers, community volunteers like yourselves are asking for a break and want to put your feet up and not think about football until January, February the next year. But um, I think so is so is the landscape now that we are you know, we start planning the moment football season ends for the next year, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, I do want to commend FFV and Anahari in particular for organising these sessions. I think we ran a pilot uh, early last year with um, the what we call the United Through Football target clubs um, and that was well received. I think we did that with you Emma as well at La Trobe and it was well received. We thought we'd expand it and ask the football community what it was that they really wanted to learn about in particular and um, topics like fundraising came up and we're very much outliers but recruitment, retention, club governance, all these things came out and um, you know what you'll find out of the presentation today which is a collection of the sport business partners research from, um, from our customers is that one of the things we were lacking as a as governing bodies uh, was uh, education for our volunteers, the guys that running clubs. Um, there's so much out there for coaches, there's so much out there for referees, and, and we forget about um, the driving force behind you know, uh, behind community football, and that's that's the volunteers and the administrators of clubs. So uh, I think this year we've got four modules, and we've ran two already early in the year. Again, well received and well represented. Um, and we're finishing up with the last two over this month and next month. And the feedback from football community was you wanted to learn about recruitment and retention after the season so you could use it to plan for the next season. So we've done that, we've listened. So well done Anahari and the guys at FFV for doing that. And again, commend you guys on a fantastic turnout. Um, I guess a little bit on me. Uh, I think I see a lot of familiar faces. I've been around FFV for a long time. Uh, uh, it's about eight years, nearly eight years now, um, in a game development role there. Um, I've actually now finished up at Football Victoria and I've moved into FFA. Um, not quite the ivory tower that a lot of people think it is. 
Um, but I have moved into uh, into the Sydney office um, in the national role, doing participation there as well. So. Uh, one of the things FFA did do a couple of years ago was commission sport business partners with the member federations um, to do some research into um, uh, customer growth for, for, our, for football and the sport of football. So we were looking at uh, the community clubs, the coaches, the referees, and of course the players and potential players. We had um, looked at all kinds of variables, whether it be female participation, uh, small side football target market, all these different things. I learned a hell of a lot from it. So the, the objectives of what I want to get out today are pretty clear on the board there. Um, I, want to, I want to make sure you guys leave here with a greater understanding of how to improve retention at your club. Uh, I'll give you an idea of the current reality of, the ret of uh, retention rates across football. Um, it's important to develop a greater awareness of the, the re uh, resources and initiatives that actually are in existence. So. A lot of people are, I know uh, every time I went out and visit clubs or talk to clubs at these sorts of um, events, you used to always question what's available for us, what does FFA do, what does FFA do? There's a lot there but I think there was always a communication breakdown between the FFA or FFA and, and community clubs as well. We're all so busy that um, I think sometimes we, we forget to either look around or have no time to read resources or whatever might be in existence. So we'll, we'll try and go through some of those and I'll point you in the right direction for some of those things. And after lunch, like Emma said, we'll go through um, uh, girls, women and girls football. It's the greatest opportunity for the game to grow and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the research and what we know about women and girls football as well to help you guys um, with your endeavours to grow that space in particular. The current reality in Victoria, there's been about 55,000 club players uh, and about 10,000 women and girls been stagnant for about four years, there, thereabouts. So we've gone from about 50,000 in 2008 to about 55. Women and girls is the um, is the fastest growing segment, so it's grown by about 35% over the past four years in that respect. So again, it's low base though. We're talking about low base. It's making inroads, but we can we can do things a lot better as well. Um, the area that's growing probably the quickest is that social area of football. Um, Futsal, yes, but also rec football. So, you know, seven-a-side football, five-a-side football, summer football, all these different ways that people want to engage where they don't want to be involved in a club setting as such, being coached by someone. They just want to play football because they love it and just turn up on a weekly basis. That's, um, again, uh, research that the Australian Sports Commission commissioned um, not long ago told us that that is the way uh, our customers are thinking now and moving towards that, um, that way. 7,000 in non-playing roles, so administrators, uh, coaches, referees. This is based on my football club data as well, so I'm sure there's still a lot of volunteers and coaches um, that aren't registering on my football club. It's important that we get everyone up there so we can, that's our communication platform. It's the way we can connect as a sport uh, to each other. So it's important, um, we always profess it, uh, try and get everyone registered on the system as much as possible. Um, the greatest opportunities for growth and retention in the game are at that 5 to 12 age group, even a little bit younger, around 3 and 4, um, is what the uh, research is telling us. Um, that's also in, uh, in terms of developing participants into greater fans of the game as well, connecting to the A-League and, and international football. Um, and like I said about girls, um, there's still so much potential uh, to grow that girls space. Uh, the challenges for football, as I mentioned, club capacity, so obviously there's a lot of demand for the game, there's a lot of people that want to play it, our facilities aren't keeping pace with that demand, and also volunteer shortages. A lot of people um, don't really want to put up their hand anymore, mums and dads, like they used to 10, 20 years ago. It's, it's, we're finding it increasingly hard to find, um, I guess, not only volunteers, but also good quality volunteers that provide a quality service to you, your potential customers as well. So we'll look a little bit at that. Um, competition from uh, various sports, not just the traditional sports, the mainstream, so IFL and, uh, and cricket as such, but also netball, um, but also these, um, what they call, uh, oh, what do they call them, ultimate sports or whatever they are now that are starting to make their way into the landscape. Um, things like skateboarding and surfing and all these other things which are um, starting to make their way through. So. Lots of competition in the markets uh, place for the same customers. So we need to be on our game and ahead of our game. And like I said, that changing population, um, especially when people get into the teenage age groups and, and older than that, um, into their 20s, 
a lot of people are moving away from club football. Um, they, they want a recreation version, and I think time's got a lot to do with that. Um, people's time is very precious, uh, and they're looking at ways they can still keep active and engaged in sport without having to spend two, three training sessions a week, two, three hours at a club every, uh, every Tuesday, Thursday, and then turn up every, all day on a Saturday or a Sunday to, to play the game. So a lot of people are consuming sport in less doses and are looking for ways to do it better. Um, I'm not sure how legible that is, so I'll try and read through this. Um, why kids are playing football. Uh, playing football uh, is enjoyable, so it's about 58% I think that says. A um, little bit ahead of um, being part of the team, so 53%. Opportunity to play with friends, they're the main reasons, 51%. Um, and fitness and health gets into it when you're a little bit older, around about 13, 14, 15 mark. Um, so there's a question up, up there in terms of when you're designing your marketing campaign. So an example might be your school flyer that you might be putting together. Are you sending the right messages through those marketing campaigns? So, you know, are you, are you professing about the enjoyment people might get out of football? Are you talking about um, the, the benefits of playing the game through being involved in a team environment? Uh, or the opportunity to play with friends? So I'll touch on that friends one a little bit more because that's one of the key reasons why a lot of our kids drop out of the game um, when they join a team as well. So just, again, want you to get your thinking caps on and start thinking about your marketing campaigns. Um, and what they actually have and whether they sell the messages that um, most connect with why kids actually play football to start with. Um, and we'll come back and talk a little bit uh, about that later on. Some of the key statistics in regard to retention. So this is again through the Customer Growth Program which has been funded through FFA for the last couple of years. One of the things that staggered me when I saw this the first time was uh, that first statistic. 80% of people that leave the game in the ages of 5 to 14, the, reason, the main reason why they left was because they just weren't contacted by anyone at their club at the end of the season or at the start of the next season. So 80% of them didn't come back because their club didn't pick up the phone or didn't send them a note, didn't reconnect to tell them, hey, training starts in a month's time or we're offering you a discounted uh, membership because you're a member last year or anything like that. So, <coughs> 80% is, is a huge number. Now, I coached at a club this year, Anna's in the room from Peon Park, she can profess to that. Um, and yeah, I know, I know as well as Anna would, um, there's some kids you probably don't want to come back as well, so you don't want to connect with some families. But to think that 80% of them aren't coming back just because we're not connecting with them, it's, it's a staggering um, result. Again, it's that communication breakdown. Um, once a child leaves the game in that five to nine age group, there's little chance they're coming back, is what the research is telling us. So, really important that we're making every effort um, to keep people in the game. Because once they're gone, particularly in that young age group, it's harder to keep them or get them back. Sorry. That's all right. Just trying to get both screens going so you can see two screens. Okay. 56% um, of participants made the decision to stop playing in the middle of the previous season. Yep, I experienced that as a coach this year, a couple of kids. Um, and it was negative experiences. Now you're not going to please everyone, but I think one of the key things I'll come back to later on is just the, the importance of communicating with your families and your kids, um, and your coaches in particular, throughout the season. It, it's a non-stop um, experience. It's, you, might, you might grow participation during the season, we had a few new kids come midway through the year, but we, you also lose kids as well because it's just not meeting their needs. So it's important to, to get that information um, throughout the season as well. Lucky I'm sure you guys can see it over my head. Um, so the, the key question I'd like you to note and come back to at the, uh, when we're finished, uh, when we, we're having a conversation about this, is um, whether you guys know why your players are leaving your club. And just, just again, have a think about brainstorm a couple of ideas as I'm talking. Yeah, why not? Do you want to do that now? With the person, sorry, the, teacher, the teacher's going to leap in. Um, with the person beside you or a couple of people beside you, just take five minutes. And just jot down, if you've got a pen, um, hopefully I've only got one spare, <laughs> um, chat about why, why are your players leaving, if they are? If they're not, fantastic, you can sit there, go and get a coffee, eat some biscuits. Um, but I'm assuming the majority of you do have some churn, otherwise you wouldn't be coming today. So get loud, chat amongst yourselves, why are your members leaving? 
Excellent. Can I call that the club culture rather than the vibe? Would that? Yeah. yeah cool. <laughs> Club culture, show of hands. Anyone think club culture at your club? There's a few. Yeah, okay. So when you said the vibe or the club culture, what, what's, what's that? How's that being played out? Essentially, the committee were run by the Okay, so you couldn't, you couldn't report up, you couldn't get any help. Okay, fantastic. Other ones. We had one at the front here, and I'll come to you next. Parents. Parents. What sort of parents? <laughs> really nice ones. <laughs> Should we call them the ugly parents? <laughs> also, too, I think if you don't have proper communication, then the parents don't feel like they have a buy-in. Yeah. Yes. So it's not necessarily that they're grumpy; it's just that people are used to the organised structure in other parts of their lives. Yeah. Can I say I work across a wide variety of sports <coughs> and football? This football, as opposed to one of the other branches of football is renowned for being really bad for this. Okay, so this is a, this is a I'm going to use football, but this is a soccer football pro problem. That doesn't mean that other sports don't have ugly parents, but for some reason that seems to be played out to the nth degree in football. So how many of you had parents or that sort of ugly parent thing as one of your problems? Yeah. <laughs> ugly parent doesn't mean like literally ugly, but it's that <laughs> the abusive um, that they yell at the children, that they yell at other people's children, they yell at the umpires, they yell at the coaches. That very aggressive, um, angry parent. They try and coach the game rather than leaving it. And it's, it's they're, they're taking it far too seriously for the for the little kids particularly. If they're yelling at the volunteers too, what happens is the volunteers leave yeah. and they take their families with them. Yeah, exactly. So it's bigger than just the on field. Now, you've been waiting very patiently. Oh, okay. Some kids want better development, so they don't want to go to a bigger club. Yeah. yeah. And that's okay. As far as you losing the players, not so good. But for the sport overall, that's okay. I, I don't think every individual club, but it's the gap between the seasons that's partly long to the children. So they lose interest in that holiday period. Yeah. What I will say though is why doesn't that happen in the other footballs? Same season. And also too, I mean, the end of the A-League happens over the summer, so that sort of creates an interest. So mm. I agree with you. So that's not, not saying it's not a problem, but the other, the other footballs don't have that problem and they have this fixed season. So there's something else happening as well as that. The race issue, yeah. I don't think it's a big in soccer because everyone plays it. It's not as big as it would be in AFL, for example. You'd be really, really surprised. I've been playing soccer in Victoria since I was. Oh, no, I'm not saying it's yeah. not positive, but it, it would be. Because soccer is so multicultural, yeah. it is, it actually is more so. I, I would argue, who, 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 who feels that soccer is a place that that racial stuff is played out? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what though, also, the bigger leagues, so the, the white red leagues, like my league, I, I'm, a Aussie, I'm a fifth generation Australian, I might not look like one, but I am. Fifth generation Australian, the AFL's had to make really big efforts structurally and policy wise against it. Whereas soccer, because it's always been multicultural, it hasn't felt like it's needed to. One more, qu one more comment, and then we'll move on. Sal's slides off by heart, but I'm hoping Sal will now start to tell us how we might be able to address 
We'll get there, yeah? Some of that. I've got, I've got one more burning, one more burning. Sorry, please. Just from your experience, please, you have a rank those from your experience? Uh, actually, the next slide almost does it for us. So, yeah. Um, oh, hang on. Can I add a major yeah. one? Yeah. Um, if the coach is not happy with the club, he literally picks up his whole team and reports someone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah massive okay. problem in our game. I'm going to call it poaching. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And again, that's really, again, because my experience is a bit broader than just this football. I do a lot of work with a lot of different sports. This is really played out in soccer more than it is in other sports. Mm. I'd say one more that we've found is that um, young children would like to try a different sports. I think that's something that you don't want to consider. Um, I'm going to call it shopping. Yeah. Can you, and look, bro- can you broaden that one to just competition? Yeah, and I think, to be honest, as I said, I've got a little guy. I'm going to get him to try about a whole bunch of stuff. He's going to be an athlete. He's about a metre tall already at nearly three. So he's, he's heading in the right direction. But I'm going to get him to chop and change, except rugby league. He's not allowed to play that. <laughs> That's mummy coming in. I think that shopping's a new phenomenon too. Yes. You know, whoever's over 40... You know, we didn't do that when we were young. We Netball, played, football, we played it. one sport and that was it. And you played that because your brother played it, your sister played it, yeah. and we didn't have all these choices. Yeah. And now, two parents who are working think that they need to show their kids. You know, I'm not at home all the time, so I'm going to you know, show you what else is out there. Yeah. So I think that's a new phenomenon that we've got. It? But it's also and because it's all of you guys. We're training you up, or Sal's training you up in this session of how to get your message out there of come and play football, come and play football. Yeah. That never used to happen. No. I would, My family would play cricket, football and netball because we were in the country yeah. and we're super Anglo. <laughs> <laughs> that was what you played. Yeah. Yeah. We're in the country too, so there wasn't any football, cricket and netball. I just one more. Network, what school you go to? Just read the kids. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, Sal, help us solve the problem. All right, well, I think, like the gentleman said, uh, this is almost the ranking of all, everything you guys have said. This is what our customers, our players that have left the game have told us the reasons why they're leaving the sport. Number one, by a country mile, and has been for a very long time despite the investment in it, is the poor quality coaching. So last year we weren't able to tell you uh, when we got the details what poor quality coaching actually meant. This year we delved a little bit deeper and understand that, and I'll go into in a little bit more so what I mean by that is was it technical coaching was it personality attitude behavior we understand that a little bit more and I'll uh, I'll go into detail around that club culture uh, was it was the second one again coaching is a long way ahead as to why kids are leaving the game or people are leaving the game in general Um, poor club culture came in a close second I'll second by a little bit I should say value for money or a perceived lack of value for money Again, you, well, let's look at small-sided football as a product in the marketplace against its leading competitors, Auskick, uh, Net Set Go, uh, in terms of when they play. You're talking about programs where kids' parents are paying $65, $70 for a 12-week season, maybe, and then you go to um, football and you're getting maybe three, $400, $500 for a small-sided football season. Now, that's just a parent going... I'm going to pay 300 bucks for soccer or I'm going to pay 60 65 dollars for footy. What we're not getting the message about is what do they get for that experience at $300 a pop or whatever it might be. Um, so it's again that communication about that. Um, where at Auskick you will have a parent coach take you for a session. At soccer it's, or football it's uh, more uncommon. You, you're investing in talented coaches to take sessions. So forth, so. Can I interrupt there for one second? Of course, yeah. In the sessions at the, earlier in the year, this, this topic of the value for money came up a lot. We were talking about um, governance and running your club. And I think what was frustrating parents, and this came out to kind of clarify that, it wasn't, it was the value for money, it was particularly the juniors. Mm-hmm. Kids were saying, I'm paying $400 for a pretty crappy experience so that we can play the, pay the men to play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was that lack of transparency of where the money was going. If you said to a junior parent, this $400 is going to the coach and to the lights and to the playing fields and it was all for them, then that would be okay. The one, the, when it wasn't okay, this perceived, when you're going, okay, I'm not, if a parent's coaching me, we don't have the lights on, we've got the worst ground and it's going up. That 
that was where that value for money thing really came unpacked. It was that, well, I'm not getting the value for my money for my little kid. Yeah. As opposed to seeing how it was all spelt out. No, we're a junior club only, so we don't have that issue. And we've actually had what we call refugees from AFL or from Auskip because they don't actually play a weekly game in Auskip up to yeah. a certain age. It's just a little, it's a session in the morning. Program, yeah. So the children weren't getting that weekly. And when I mean refugees, I'm talking 20 plus kids come yeah. over to our club this year because they're not getting it. So that's a really important thing to say to people that yeah. you do get a game each week. Yeah, yeah exactly. You've got to, you've got to um, talk about what, what the experience is. Yeah. And there's ways to do that through your marketing again that you do in schools and so forth. Really understand your competitor marketplace, I guess is what I'm saying. If you're talking about 5 to 12-year-olds, you're talking about small sport 5 to 11. You're talking about small side of football versus Auskick. Yeah. Sell the benefits. Small side of football is a better product. There's no doubt about that. Um, the way we, we had a few issues with that this year, and the way we got around it was we actually explained how long the season was yeah. and, and what you're getting it, and then you compare it to like gymnastics or what you're doing gymnastics. Gymnastics is 3,500 a year yeah. by the yeah. time you work it out. So for the whole year, so you, we actually yeah. tried to relate it back to other, to other things to prove it. To yeah, prove and that actually is better than you Transparency, so, show that where yeah. the money's going. So but got, if you can't show that it's not going to the seniors, that's when you're going to get on. So Aussie Hoops is a good example. Yeah. Uh, dancing is a good example yeah. for yeah. girls. Swimming they, lessons. They, they, swimming yeah. lessons, they charge by the term mm -hmm. so it looks cheaper. Maybe it's the way we've got to do it in our game. Maybe we're going to say, all right, you can play, I don't know, first half of the season, you pay this much, and do the whole season. Maybe it's just smarter ways of how we sell the, uh, the cost of playing football. I'll move on, conscious of time. Um, well, uh, actually, before I do move on, Brimbank uh, uh, brought up a really good point about my football club and the power of my football club, the, uh, the system itself. Everyone's familiar with my football club now. It's been a few years in the marketplace. So my football club is a very powerful tool. Uh, in terms of uh, your value for money, you can actually communicate that using my football club. You can break down every element of where a club fee is going on my football club and tell your parents that, just through that system. Um, you could also ask for reports about your churn rates, you know, who's coming, who's going, three years of participation at your club. Ask FFV and then my football club team to come up with a report specific for your club over the last three years on uh, your recruitment, how many new players you've got every year, who's leaving the club. They can do that so you can understand your customers better as well. Uh, the quality of competition uh, was a big one for young kids. Again, small side of football and juniors uh, and where they were playing. So kids were either, it was not competitive enough for them, they were winning by too big a margin. We had an example this year with Keon Parks, under eight boys, where we were playing I won't name the club, we're playing a, in the Joeys as the entry level, under eights, Joeys. My boys got smashed, I think, 19, 20 nil, not keeping score, but it was it's disheartening for them as young kids, but even for the other team, it doesn't, it's not, it's not fun. It really isn't. So, again, grading appropriately um, based on where your kids are at, important. Um, and like I said, too competitive, especially some girls. Some girls come into the sport, um, you know, they'll, they'll either come in as one or two, and you, I know this happens a lot. Oh, we'll throw them in with the boys, no worries. All of a sudden, it's a more competitive environment. They're not in it for that. So, especially at a young age, um, to really conscious about who's there for the competitive elements and who's not. Dissatisfaction with coaching. All right, so this was the breakdown. So, volunteer coaches, uh, parents had to coach. This is big in our sport. They're not, they don't want... Um, unqualified coaches. Our sport, uh, the parents in our sport are looking for, for coaches that know what they're doing. Huge, 28% of people who responded to the survey said that. Um, coaches lack technical knowledge, uh, strategies, rules, skill development, all those sorts of things. Again, comes back to the coaches knowing what they're doing, having uh, being educated, having experience in the game. Really big one. So last year, it was assumed that um, personality, um, attitude towards kids, and ability to connect with kids was probably more a reason as opposed to the technical knowledge of the game. But it's very clear that the people in our game, it, it's about, does the coach know what they're doing? Can I trust the coach with my young boy or young girl? Um, they're, look, they're looking, if you're gonna charge three, four hundred dollars, they're looking for quality services by a coach, is what our football people are telling us. 
Um, not enough focus on developing teaching players again goes through that. So the, the first four coaches not qualified, lack training is all about experience and knowledge of a coach. So I've mentioned that already, technical knowledge, experience, and we'll talk about what we can do as a football community to help um, develop that in, in our coaches. Um, it was very clear that we need FFV, FFA, need to keep developing a coaches network of instructors um, to deliver the education programs, make the education programs more accessible, more time friendly, more cost friendly, so we can get more parents onto courses um, and keep developing them. I think the other point is, in the past, the coaching courses, you did a, you did a two-day course, you were qualified for four years. You didn't have to go back to do another course, you, you, could, you left your own devices to go online once they step, um, you, you know, download your own resources, so you weren't supported, you were left on your own for four years. So I think FFA's caught on to that and trying to do more about developing coaches throughout their journey, not just every four years. Steph, you want to make a comment? When you go with the coaches, like us, we've got finally getting coaches and we're going fine. But other clubs try and poach them through the season. So you, you're going well, they're not happy with their own, but they're trying to poach yours. So how do you stop clo clubs trying to poach your coaches? The coach will say, no, we're happy where we are. But the point is, they're not, bigger clubs aren't happy with what they got. They see what you've got and your coach is developing. We don't pay coaches and our coaches do well. But we're putting through forces and we're prison. But clubs are poaching, trying to poach them. Yeah. So how do you stop that? All right. So the question, I have to do this for the regional guys. Um, the question was about um, trying to stop uh, coaches being poached by uh, other clubs around you, surrounding you. Um, without getting into too much detail, it's about understanding, I guess, what your coaches want from you and, I guess, valuing them as a service provider for your club, more importantly. So... I guess that the toughest part is if you're not paying them at the moment and it's they're looking for, for money for their time and another club down the road said, yeah, we'll pay you whatever it is, probably more likely to go there because they're going to get paid for their time. So it's about, I guess, valuing the services they're providing and trying to meet their needs in that respect. That's just feedback. I don't know how other... Does anyone else want to make a comment around that? Has that happened at another club and someone's dealt with it? Anyone want to share an experience? Um, oh, we have one. We, have, we pay very few. We pay two of our coaches, and because um, we're a junior club, we just make sure that we involve the coaches in everything as much as we can. I mean, we have had someone try and poach one of our coaches, but they stay with us because we have that great culture where all the parents are involved, yeah. and there's probably only one army parent out of about 400. And I think we prospered that by making sure everyone feels really welcome. And I know that's just like an easy sentence, but you do that through great communication and, you know, do it on game days, each, each home game, you've got to have someone assigned to each team to make sure that they're liaising with the parents and with the coaches. And the coaches have always got to have meetings regularly as well as a group. It's great, uh, great feedback. Couldn't agree more. So it's about it's about your environment again. It, it's about what you offer people to stay. And then when we're talking about retention and all this, we're not just talking about retention of your players. We're talking about retention of your good people and your coaches as well. So you can apply those. We, we might pose this question to you and break for another three or four minutes, but let's talk about coaching and what your club's done to recruit, train, recognise and support coaches at your club. Let's share those ideas because again, what's happening at one club might not be happening at another. So, um, Do you want to just, right? We might just whiteboard this. Yeah, sure. Um, who has? How do you take care? How do you show coaches the love? That's what you're doing. You're telling them that you like them and that you appreciate their work and that they're awesome. Do we do that at all? Yes? Um, payments for the courses or contributing financially. Okay, so dollars for professional development. Yep. Yeah, that's quite up to their children. You might cover their children's fees and part of the program. Subsidise. Oh, I can't spell today. Subsidise. Kids. Fees. Yep, how else do we show the our coaches the love? The manager and the coach have a good relationship. Good. So foster good relationships. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, you, yeah? I uh, have regular coaches meetings where a community member is present to support everyone. Yep. <laughs> 
two are kind of linked. If you're giving the coaches a chance to talk to each other, they're not feeling quite so aligned. Yep. Allow them to choose their team manager. Don't see them with a parent they don't like. I'm going to put that with relationships as well. Choose team manager. Yep. We actually got a lot of coaches that don't have kids in our club, so we actually cover their expenses instead of subsidising food. Great. <coughs> Have you noticed that no one yet has said anything about actually paying them? Because not many of our coaches really are doing it for the money. Well, we do pay our coaches. Yeah. And we also offer um, some of our young coaches, we offer them ongoing training, so the director of coaching attends up many of their sessions to give feedback and ideas and early days. Can I call that mentoring rather than yeah, training? It's yeah. Mentoring program. It's a really good, yeah. I, I, but we do that as well as money. Not yeah. money, but the other thing is what we've found in the past is that when they get to uni, they need money. So they go and get a part time job. So all the training that you give them is lost. But if you pay them enough to pay for them to go out and some petrol, yeah. they'll stay with you. And yeah. actually, we've got some coaches who've been four or five years and have really developed with the parents as well. So the difference between paying them and covering expenses. As a volunteer, it gets old pretty quickly if it's costing you to volunteer. The parent situation is different because we know it's going to cost us in our dollars or in our time or whatever. But those coaches who aren't parents um, at least cover their expenses. Can I get just a show of hands quickly? How many clubs actually have appointed a club technical director or a director of coaching? Yeah, it looks like there's a majority in the room. And it's a, it's, you can, you can go out and pay one coach, a, a technical expert, to be a manager of your coaching network. I think it's a great model, to be quite honest. I've seen it work pretty well. It's a point of difference from our game to many others, that you, you do have appointed someone who knows what they're doing. The issue is it's the, there's a lack of quality coaches also in, in the Australian landscape. You can see that. Uh, only finally we've been able to appoint a, a national uh, coach from Australia. Ange Foster Coglick, fantastic, Victoria, great. Um, so we're, get, we're getting there, <laughs> we're getting there slowly, but down at the grassroots, again, it's only been a couple of years that we've had accessible coaching uh, courses available to everyone, to the, to the parent, to everyone else. So the quality's not quite there yet. There's a lack of them, but if every club, we've got 330 odd clubs in Victoria, if every club had a technical director or a director of coaching, you're paying them a couple of hundred bucks for their time for the year, just to monitor the coaches and set up uh, coach, coach development sessions for them, and you're going okay. Does anyone's club have a coach award at their awards night? Yep, that's a really nice, but people love an award. Even if you feel like it's a bit naff, you still get up and get a bit blushy and smiley when you get given one. So add a coach's award to your awards night. It can be a $10 trophy, it doesn't have to be anything really. But that sort of stuff does make people feel like, oh, yes, thank you, I was a good coach, I did put some effort in. I know as a coach, um, one of the things I loved was just at the end of the year, getting, the, get, getting the, the team photo you know, with you and your kids at the end of the year, giving to you and saying thanks for your efforts. As a coach, it was brilliant. Yeah, you like recognition. Yeah, it's yeah, really recognised. You just want to have a recognition that you've done a decent job. Yeah. You know, I was very thankful with Keon Park. I just did that out of my uh, <coughs> out of my time, but they recognised me at the end of the year with a little gift pack and saying thanks very much. Didn't do it for that, but it was great to be recognised for you know a good 22, 23 weeks of um, service. So there's a lot of really easy, quite cheap ways of showing your coaches the love. And can I please say to um, Sal, yep. replace the word coach with official yeah. or any other volunteer, the same principles apply. Yeah. A couple were saying, one of these guys who was at their clubs here, probably be older than where we come from, I got the very small thing. Yeah. We struggle to find a decent coach. Yeah. So, in terms of, you know, we spoke about culture. To recruit, yeah, well, that's one of the things we're talking about in terms of recruitment. One, one place to start, I'll give you an example at FNV, that there's a database of a national coaching system where coaches go and are registered to do courses. 
we can. All you need to do is put a request into FFA, and they sh they can uh, advertise any positions that might be available at clubs to that network themselves. I will talk a little bit more about um, another resource we've got a bit later, but Sport Education Development Australia. Um, yes, we're talking 16 to 19 year old boys and girls in a program, but in February they uh, 350 to 400 kids are going through a coaching course, whether it's a grassroots junior license, and they need to complete their hours throughout the year and they're looking for coaching work within community clubs so you can tap into that network too and it's just a matter of going back to FFA and saying look we've got holes in these teams this is what we're looking for can you promote it through your network that, that's one way but does anyone want to share what you guys do to recruit coaches as well yep Gumtree. advertising on Gumtree yeah yeah, yeah. So many ways to connect social media and all those other areas, great. Yep. Uh, through our seniors and reserves team, we've had juniors that have gone through the ranks and they're still there. Fantastic. By allowing the coach to Yeah, a great way to retain people too. You know, members of the club that will stay there 10, 20 years, their families will stay there afterwards, great. Um, team Up is another one. You mentioned Gumtree. Team Up with Vic Health. Um, another app you can download from the App Store, it's free. And that's another way you can advertise sports specific. So, yep. I think one of the biggest things is retaining players once they retire. Like you go to AFL games, yeah. and that, that's massive for where yeah. I think the players lose soccer. Yeah. So yeah, it's, a, it's about, um, I guess, reconnecting and, and um, investing in you know, a retirement plan for your older senior players as well. That, that helps a lot too. So, um, Do we want to move on? Just conscious on time? Yeah. All right, cool. So again, a couple, um, couple of things here just to mention. So developing a coaching uh, club coaching curriculum with FFV ZDOs. So there's, there's seven full-time zone development officers at FFV employed to do some mentoring and coach development. Do you know who yours is? Put your hand up if you know who your zone development officer is. Yeah, note, to, note to FFV. <laughs> so, yeah. in, in the metro regions, you've got Anthony Frost and Darren Tan, Anthony Northwest, Darren Southeast. Um, uh, both have been around a few years now and spent a lot of time connecting face to face with clubs and club coaches, delivering coach education programs. And in the regions, every every regional zone's got one full time person as well now. So, um, I, I would. I dare say get those guys in and sit with your coaches and develop a coach development plan with your, either your technical director or your most senior coach. Um, hosting, we, we've had these uh, things spoken about by the, um, by the floor, which is great. So hosting regular coaching forums and meetings. You know, Melbourne Heart do this really well. They get your John Aloisi's, um, your, 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 your A-League club coaches to come in and actually run a coach-to-coach -coach session. So you can actually request that through Melbourne Heart. More than happy to go and deliver that with their coaches. Just ask for the topic and they'll prepare it. So connecting with your A League clubs, because they want to build their brand too. It's really important that we're um, developing fans of the game as well. Um, but then again, also talk to FFB and they can connect you with some talented coaches as well and they can deliver these for you if you don't already have a technical director. Um, understand coaches' training and development needs first before you're going to go invest in it. So, it's all good and, and proper to say, right, yeah, you're, you're coaching the under 13s, you need to do the youth licence or whatever it is, go, here's some money, go and do your youth licence. But maybe there's other elements that they need to work on, like communication skills or organisation skills that you can find a short course for them pretty quickly and easily to, um, to go and do and invest in that. Um, smart, so specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time-bound time, uh, time -bound, uh, action plans for your coaches. Coaches are there, some coaches are there for a career as well, and they want to develop as individuals too, so let's work on their career development as, um, as individuals too. <coughs> um, ensuring if you, or coaches are coaching juniors, making sure they're registered with a children, uh, working with children's check, and that you're checking that as well. Always ask, it should be the first question, if a parent comes up to you and says, I want to coach, do they have a working with children's check? Uh, making sure they're cleared. Um, that's, that's for anyone under 18 that they're working with, even a 17 and 11 month old. The person coaching that 17 year or 11 month old still has to have a working with children's check. It's not just for the little littlies, it's right up until the day they <coughs> turn 18. So be really aware of that. I think sometimes we think yeah. about 16, 17, so they're still children as far as the law is concerned. And the club would just be 
eviscerated in the courts if anything happened to those kids? Yeah, it's really important, it's due diligence from club committee members to make sure that you understand your coach is cleared um, to work with kids. Really important because if something does happen and you're not aware of it, um, yeah, it could come back to bite you. Yeah, sorry. Is that also um, other volunteers as well? So Anyone? Yeah, yeah, so that's what I thought. So it's that's committee members. Volunteers yeah, it's, as well, like team members, yeah. everyone. It is free for volunteers, so yeah. it's just a little, you go to the post office, collect the form, and then get a photo, and then that's pretty much it. But anyone with any contact with kids should have a working with children. It includes senior coaches with juniors coming into the teams. That's what you miss out on all the time. Yeah, that's what I mean. So if there's anyone under the age of 18, literally, in your purview, make sure that all of those people have a working with children's check. So if you've got a 17-year-old playing up, that coach and team manager will need a working with children's check. Yeah. If you've got a 17-year-old coach and a junior side to that, does a 17-year-old need a working with children's check? No, it's adults, so it does get very grey. <laughs> And that's not to say that 17-year-olds couldn't do something horrible to 11-year-olds, but that's kind of the space that we're, we're working in. So basically, any adult that's got anything to do with the club, get them to get a, dub, a working with children check. It's free. You just do it through the post office. Get the form through the post office. Can I do a dummy room screen resident, though, isn't it? If you put someone overseas who's helping the training or coaching, you can't do a dummy dog screen. No, because it's, they haven't got an Australian record. Um, they will, if, you, if you're allowed to be. It depends on what visa you're on. So if you're on a temporary, like, yes, yes. or temporary, yeah. Yeah. Worst case scenario, get them to fill out the form, and if it comes back saying we can't do anything about it, at least you know you've tried. Yeah. Um, Again, start of the season, co there's coach accreditation programs. That's when the, you know, February, March is when FFE do organise a lot of the programs and they're out and about running a lot of these. They're using club facilities now. Um, so if you want to host a coach education program, just let Darren or Anthony know, connect, or someone at FFE know that you want to host a program. They'll do it at your club, they'll find a time. Best to organise it now. We can get it promoted nice and quickly and, and early as to get as much uptake as possible. Um, get your coaches done before the start of the season is, is something I suggest. Register your coaches on my football club. It's the way that FFA, FFE can actually provide them with development tools and resources um, that they can use to continue their development. So whether it be online, I know FFA is working on a coaching app at the moment. Um, so coaches can have something there all the time, so really good. There's other resources that are on, online that they can take. Now a lot of coaches I see uh, are out on the, on the pitches with iPads now with their plans and sessions. Um, these, that's the sorts of things that are available now. Yeah. Do they include their same courses? Yeah. Really? Okay, cool. Yeah, so FFB won't deliver them, but they can, you know, they've got a good um, partnership with Sports Medicine Australia and St John's. Yeah. We can, I think we've offered discounted, um, because of the partnership, we've offered discounted um, entry into those courses. I think some have even been free over the past. So it's just about, again, getting that communication and, and uh, knowing about it more than anything else. Yeah. So what sport education are you saying? Yeah, I'll touch on it when we get to it. I'll, I'll expand a little bit more about who they are. Um, so make sure they're registered. Uh, ensure coaches understand the difference between coaching males and females. We'll touch on females a bit later on because there is a difference between coaching with two groups. Um, I think we've touched a lot about coach management and education. Like I said, value it and invest in it because it's the number one reason why people are leaving. Okay. Um, club culture, uh, I think you, you provided some really good examples of what you can do as a club in that respect. So calendar of social events is just one example. Plan, plan it throughout the season. Connect with everyone at, the, at your club. If you're a family club, organise family events. Uh, little things like that to just improve it. Uh, lots of uh, information around developing a female friendly club culture as well. Because again, there's um, lots of resources available and we'll touch that in the female session later on. Uh, your value for money. So value and communicate your service offerings. Go through what you offer in each of your products. Articulate that back to your customers. I can't uh, mention no more. And again, don't be scared to, to point fun at your competitors in the marketplace. I'll come back to small side of football. As a product, it's much better than Auskick. It's Auskick's a program, small side of football isn't a program. It's it's the way kids play the game, and kids want to play the game. So um, 
make sure you communicate the points of differences and, and what people are getting for their money in terms of that as well. Um, Sorry, yeah. that. If that's a, such a, if that's, I don't know if it makes sense every time to go and do that analysis, if it's pretty much standard across the states, is, is there any opportunity for the FFP to say, look, here's a fact sheet of the differences between um, yeah. full side football and everything else, and that way every, every club in Victoria gets that benefit? Yeah, so the question's about uh, FFV providing a bit of a fact sheet uh, on um, the different services offered and the benefits of playing small sided football versus anything else. So Anahar is just describing that. And we'll, uh, it's, it's a great question, it's a great point. FFV can easily do something around small sided football versus the other products in the marketplace as well. That's not a problem. Um, it does, the, the, I guess the difference is that whilst fixed costs supply at FFA and FFV, club costs vary. Don't, one club's charging thousands for small-sided participation and saying that this is what they offer, whereas another club might uh, charge $100, $150, $200. So there is a massive variable. And so that, that comes down to what service each club is providing spe uh, specifically. There is a difference. So um, sometimes it is, it is better to be valued club by club as well. But we can provide a general overview, most definitely. Um, the quality of competition. FFV have organised grading days, especially in small sided football uh, this year. I highly um, encourage each club to register their teams in these grading days, which happen about two or three weeks before the season start. So I think they had one at Darabin this year and, and at Knox as well. Um, get a feel for where your kids should be. Um, you know, under eights, boys, small sided football, joeys. You shouldn't have a, kid, a group of kids that have been in your club for four years already, as an example because you've got to understand the difference between an entry level for a new participant versus your kangaroos and the difference between who should be playing kangaroos and such. So don't, small side of football in particular isn't about how many goals you win by. It's about the experience of playing football for every kid. So think about your, comp your competitor as much as your own kids because you can lose them if it's not enjoyable, like we said. Sorry, I'm the person asking lots of questions. Is the grading right. explained on the website? Because I wasn't able to figure out last year yeah where we would push some of our teams because it wasn't clearly explained. So that's certainly a big factor. So like, like you just said, yeah. some of them make the 40 years, they should be in Joey's. Yeah, cool. So the, there, was, there was a question around a bit more explanation and clarity yeah, around how to grade yeah, yeah, from FFE. So we're making a note of that now and um, go back to our competition team with that feedback. Add that as well around the change in the zones for the clubs that happened last year that we had we had some teams that were under eight, they were travelling for four or five minutes an hour to go to a game, and then we got moved into a different place so we would have less travelling. So the joys of all these kangaroos, there was also split between different zones, whether you were or south, so whether you're south or east, there's a south, south, there's a north, there's a Yeah. It's a massive difference, and that was hugely frustrating. Okay, so the comment was around zoning um, and travel times for teams and so forth. So just a review, maybe, of how FFV can improve that um, at competition level. Can't ask unbreed parents to travel for yeah. five minutes to an hour. Yeah, no. Or I'd, 20 minutes or 50 minutes. Like, yeah, no, it's fine. Yeah, I lived that this year. We, I think one of our girls' games was an hour away. Um, so yeah, I understand totally. Yep. Um, can I ask about the Women's Metro League as well? In Division 4 this year, we've had teams coming in that were playing against, as a walking in, entry level type team, but were actually in the match. So, in terms of the grading stuff. So, not just small sided football, not grading small should happen football throughout? Football, yeah. All right, we'll make a note. Um, and a hurry. So, grading for older age groups as well, even up to yes. Metro yes. Leagues? Yes, and just playing, playing teams that, sorry, um, that are yeah, much further away from Melbourne, it's not really Metro, which I know is, yeah, in terms of zoning, it's not really stuff. Yeah. Had to travel large distances to play. No worries. So yeah. It's all key. Are the grading days for the participants or for the club committee to come down and discuss? Uh, the grading days themselves have been organised so kids can actually play against other teams and see where they're at against other teams to determine their ability. But yeah. So is there an opportunity to have a grading day more to the south? Because those locations that you just mentioned... Yeah, are east and north. No one yep. in our club will drive there. Okay, so the, the comment is, can FFB have grading days in the south region? Um, we'll make a note of that. That's good feedback. Uh, up the back. Uh, what are the ages for the uh, grading? Uh, well, this year they were small-sided, so I think they were under 8s, under 9s, 10s, 11s, as, as key focus areas. 
Did you request, did you want any other? No, no, just, no? Going into just understanding it? Yeah. Uh, look, I, look, I've got the long side. I don't really understand how you do the small side of tickets you see here. But what, no, what yeah. we've done in Geelong is basically we split up the. Northern Hub, Southern Hub? Into two sides, yeah. Northern South. And all the clubs go to, doesn't matter how many small side of football teams you go, yeah. they all go to that Northern Zone or the Southern Zone, yeah. and they play games against each other and we don't have such rigid fixtures. Yeah. They come out every week basically so that once you start getting clubs being hammered, being hammered, <coughs> we have an administrator specifically doing that job and that's all he does is small sided football. Yeah. He adjusts the fixtures but make sure those teams don't play each other. Yeah. So small sided football in Geelong is the competition essentially managed by the clubs within each of those hubs. Yes. Not not FFV as such. No, yeah, no, the that's clubs, the difference. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So we might keep moving because we are running short on time. We do have to keep to the agenda. Um, uh, we talked about two competitive, flex uh, flexible participation options. So outside of FFV, for example, has initiated this year's summer sevens or started a couple of years ago, but it's really growing legs in summer. Seven aside football, it's it's huge. So. Maybe it's you know, clubs putting their hand up to host venues. It's also a good revenue raiser for you guys as well. FFB can manage the competition. You just put your, your venue up as a, as a potential, um, potential way there. But also offering seven-a-side football throughout the season as well. The more you, um, you champion uh, flexible participation offerings with FFB, the more you can influence the type of competition structures they can initiate uh, from their point of view too. Uh, communication, huge. All right. Like I said, collect and load all your contact information onto my football club for everyone in the football family. I won't elaborate any more on that. Uh, contact, uh, yeah, connect with your past players using a variety of platforms. It's not just the old letter in the mail. Let's phone them up, let's SMS them, let's connect with them on social media. Let's All these different ways to connect with people, we should be tapping into that as much as we possibly can. Um, you know, email through my football club another way. So and keep it frequent. It's not just at the start of the year with your welcome pack and then thanks for coming, see you next year. You know, maybe it's a monthly newsletter from the club. You know, maybe it's weekly saying either the results of all the games this week or whatever it might be. Let's keep it frequent and ongoing. Um, make people feel like they're part of something. Celebrate and share achievements and milestones at the club. Might be... Um, Little Sarah playing her first game for, for the club. It might be a 50 game milestone. It might be um, a winning streak, maybe two in a row, three in a row, whatever it might be. Let's celebrate all the big things. It might be a committee member celebrating a birthday, whatever it might be. Let's get people to connect with each other at the club. It's a family, it's a family environment we're trying to set up. Um, an introduction pack for all new players and all new parents to the club. Give them information about your club, its culture, its background its roots, all these things, people need to understand that so they can celebrate with you, your, your history as well as help you evolve um, for, the, um, for the future as well. The end of season survey, huge. FFE does it to everyone, but it's important that each club goes back out to its participants, coaches um, and parents uh, and players to understand what they enjoyed about their experience at the club this year, what could improve for next year. <coughs> Uh, let's get constructive feedback from our from our people. So, I don't, hands up if your club initiated an end of season survey this year. So, yeah, there's a few there, but probably uh, more so they didn't. So, really important. But those that did, did you find it helpful? No, what I'm saying is, oh. do you have a template? You're saying you do it, so, yeah. so we don't have to then went from the field. Yeah, so sure. So, um, the, the comment was, can FFB provide a template for a survey? Uh, I would say it's pretty easy, and we can. And Just a hard is making questions. Know. Yep. Yeah, Survey Monkey is really easy, free free resource to use as well. Um, appoint a communications coordinator. Um, again, we don't want to leave too many jobs to too few people and, and burn ourselves out. The, that CEDA group I was talking to you about uh, earlier, so they're looking for work placement hours. High school kids are looking for work placement hours as well. There's, there's people, your juniors, your under 16s, under 15s, that are really good on their social platforms, let's be honest. Maybe we can give them a job at, at a community level that they, they can be the communications coordinator for the club. So one of the most important roles at a club. So let's, let's value and invest in that one as well. 
Uh, let's move on to recruitment, and there's an exercise in here as well. Um, one of the things that came back from our research uh, loud and clear was that the game's greatest recruiters it's, is actually its current playing list. They're the ones that go back to tell friends and family members about the experience they're having. So if they're having a positive experience, you're going to get, uh, you, they're the ones that are going to drive new, new recruits to your club. So again, connecting with your current members, encouraging them to go and recruit people, incentivise them to go and recruit people. I don't know if people are members of A-League clubs or even AFL clubs or whatever. I'll say I'm, I'm a member of the Geelong Football Club and as a member, I always get the notification about member, get member. Get us five members and we'll, we'll uh, reward you with a, I don't know, a free membership for the following year, whatever it might be. Little incentives um, to try and get people, you know, your greatest recruiters to bring new people into your club. Um, again, the relationships with your local community are really important. I think people understand the, the role of schools and the teachers within the schools and connecting with them. You want Schools are actually massive, um, teachers I should say, teachers in particular are huge uh, recruiters for you. They're the ones that spend the time with the kids. They're the ones that will provide the sample opportunity before they go and join a club to, to play long term. So really... Um, Think about what the club can do to invest in developing the teacher's ability to provide a really good um, soccer program at the school. And I think um, James will touch on it from an active after school perspective a bit later about the, the importance of um, investing in your local teachers, getting to know your teachers, finding out who the soccer champions are and helping them deliver a good sample program. So you don't have to go to do it and on behalf of the club, the teacher can do it. But let's, let's give them the tools they need to go back and provide a good sample and be recruiters for you guys as well. Um, all right, the question I'll pose, is your club meeting the needs of its customers at the moment? Before we do that, who are our customers? Let's start thinking about them. The players. Players are one, one group of customers. Players, who else might be our customers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, really thank good. you. Who else? Supporters. Like friends, family members. Yep. I'm going to say family, but that's the club family rather than the actual literal family. Community, um, community? schools, councils, um, people you rent from, the sponsors. Who else might be your your um, customers? Sponsors. Sponsors. Yep. Coaches. And draw on the um, draw on the information I provided very early on about reasons why kids play football um, in terms of your recruitment pool, and make sure you connect with them on that level. Poor your old officials them. never get a gig. Do we care about our officials? Are they part of our customers? They kind of are, because they're often you. Yeah, you guys are also the officials. Who wants to put their hand up to be... You're talking about referees? Or even the people... Do you guys, I'm assuming you guys have marshals? Yeah, yeah, yeah marshals. Yeah, so think yeah. about who wants that job. But you've got to kind of, you know, got to make it for them to have that job. So your officials... When officials... I mean, anyone involved in match day who has a little job to do. Okay, so they could be your referees, they could be your marshals, they could be your team managers. Those people, they are also your customers. When we talk about participa participants and recruitment, we always default to these guys. I would argue that these are the easiest ones to get. Yeah? It's a hell of a lot easier to get players than it is to get officials. Or sponsors. Yeah. Okay? So broaden who you think your participants are. When we talk about inclusive environments, like let's get more women involved, let's get more people with a disability involved, let's get more whoever involved, they don't have to be on the pitch. I have been researching soccer now for how many years? Seven? Seven, yeah, seven years. I cannot kick a ball to save my life. Aussie rules ball, I can kick 25 metres quite comfortably. Football, I've never got my head around it. That does not mean I am not part of this useful community. There's plenty of jobs for me, just not here. 
So don't focus just on the players. And what we find also is that football, this football in particular, not only just focuses on the players, but they just focus on the senior men. And I've done work with FFB previously about why women were leaving, as in adult women were leaving. And it's like, well, because we, we get fifth turn at the ground. We get to train for half an hour a week because this was when the drought was on particularly. We never got to play on the pitch. Um, we pay $500 and it goes to pay him. You know, you've got to think about, it's not just the players and it's not just your ones, your firsts, okay? So when you're thinking about, and this will be homework, I've got to show you some homework later, but when you're thinking about your, your members, it's not just your players. It's this bigger community. And you know what? These sponsors and your parents are probably your biggest ones that you have to woo. Yeah. And in terms of, I guess, meeting the needs, understanding what the needs are, again, we talked about surveying, pretty simple. <coughs> I've given you some feedback from research, so you can, hopefully there's a bit more understanding of what the needs actually are first for particular groups um, before we go and implement things too. So we're going to be smart about what we implement, yeah. this is what we're saying. Because your officials, and I know football has this huge problem, with, with women in particular, there's nowhere for your female reps to get changed. There's a referee's change room, sure, but there's one. Yeah. You know, just things like that. You've got to think of how can I make this better if there's only one referee's change room. And let's think about where that female rep's going to go to get changed. We're not going to make her get them changed in her car every single time. Let's put another space for her for the afternoon or something like that. Yeah, all right. We'll push on um, where there might be promoters and our greatest pull our promoters. There's also going to be detractors as well. And again, it comes down to the quality of experience that you're providing people, whether they're going to be a promoter or a detractor. And the sport does have a lot of detractors at the moment. And these are the reasons why people are not promoting our game or your club. Too expensive to play, pretty high up on the list. 26% of people don't promote us because we're too expensive as a sport. Um, that's different to value for money. Okay, so too expensive, value for money. If we, if we tell people why it costs as much as it does to play, it might play, it might play a bit of a difference. Um, poor quality uh, and quantity of referees. Massive issue, and that's again for more the older guys. Particularly, I know for women and girls, it's a huge issue. Um, second class citizens, most of the time, women and girls are treated as, and so they either won't get a referee, or they'll get a poor quality referee, whatever it might be, and that's one of the reasons why we're losing a lot of people at that point. Um, poor quality of coaches, I don't have to expand on that anymore. Poorly organised club. Um, a lot of that's got to do with maybe the, the quantity of volunteers you've got running around for you. Again, too, too, too much left to too few, trying to do too much for the club. Um, uh, issues with grading, we've touched on a lot of these, but I guess the point is address these issues, understand what these issues are, addressing them to reduce the number of detractors. Okay? Go back, analyse your fees, analyse what, what your service offerings are. Do they match up? Look at your competitors, what are they doing? Really understand that. Um, some resources and initiatives that are available to, to you. So FFA are investing in a play football campaign, which is a promotional campaign. My understanding is that they're putting in a lot of money towards um, signage for clubs, banners, uh, promotional flyers, which is all around this play football thing. So I think every club in Victoria, every club in Australia, I should say, will be getting some sort of signage that they can put up around their club facility to promote playing football as a starting point. So. Don't go spend your money on something that FFA is going to do on your behalf, is what I'm saying there, okay? So if you go and, if you go put in money towards, you know, 500 bucks towards a billboard that, I don't know, uh, Barry Plant Real Estate can do for you, don't bother. FFA, FFA are putting money in for that, so save you 500. Um, grant programs for specific groups, you've got Sport Direct Victoria, uh, which have got uh, club uniform grants, Big Health, which have got club equipment grants, your local councils have got plenty of grants. FFB's got grants. If you're targeting indigenous communities, if you're target, targeting um, new arrival communities or uh, people with disabilities, there's ways you can offset some fees in that. So it's not about making the club money, it's about making it more accessible for people to play the game, engage with the game. 
special interest groups. Um, I've talked about the coaching app, which will come out, and there will be also other platforms uh, available and other development tools available from FFA and FFE's website specifically around um, uh, coaching. So I know James might talk a little bit about the, um, the football resource, which is available from the Active After School website as well. I used it a lot this year, to be honest. The kids absolutely loved the pro, the um, the games that were involved in that for my kids. They absolutely loved it. Which school was that? Uh, active After School Care. So it's the Australian Sports Commission. James, you might touch on this later, but it's the Australian Sports Commission website. Uh, and Ahari, what I might get, well, what we might do is we'll get the um, resource up on FFE's website and you can download it from the coaching section. So that's the Active After School uh, program. So I can, 12 to 16 weeks worth of um, uh, uh, activities that coaches can implement. CEDA, uh, coaching equipment. Make sure your coaches actually have the right resources to go and deliver a, an experience. So they'll need balls, they'll need uh, ball bags, co uh, cones, bibs, little goals, whatever it is. Make sure the club's got a budget to, to have those um, tools and resources available. And like I said, grant programs exist. Put an application in, spend the hour it takes to put one in. Um, and uh, submit it. Yeah, up the back. Where are the details of these uh, grant, grant programs? Um, so the question is, where's the details of the grant programs? And Hari, do we have them on the club page of FFP's club website? Page. Yeah, so club development page of the FFP website should have a detail of available grants as they as they're um, as they're up and uh, running throughout the time uh, throughout the year. Uh, CEDAR is Sport Education Development Australia. FFV and all the other sports at this point, um, in 2008, initiated a partnership with this uh, organisation, which is an educational organisation, educational institute. They target um, 16, 17, 18, 19 year old boys and girls who are disengaged from mainstream schooling, have a passion for sport, and maybe want to start and launch a career in the sport industry. So this is a very specific education program where they can finish their VCE, um, but also uh, finish with either a certificate three, certificate four, a diploma in sport development, and enter in uni at you know, year two or year three, and also get full time jobs in sport that way. These guys are a resource. The reason why FFB invested in this partnership is because they're a resource for you guys. One of the things they do a lot of is promote the game through the schools. All right? So they're a school based program. They'll be in schools three, uh, two to three times a week in primary schools promoting club football, as an example. They'll wear the Victory brand, they'll wear the Heart brand, but they'll always leave flyers about finding your club on the My Football Club website or whatever it might be. They, are also, they also have an obligation to complete several numbers of hours of work experience as well, which they should be doing with you guys. So they should be connecting with you guys. They should be, um, again, look to, towards, uh, to, to communication to, as a communications role. They could be your communications coordinator. They can be coaches. You know, they're, they're skilled to be coaches at your club. They can be taking your small side of football kids as starting points. Um, yeah, you had a question? Um, my son's in Cedar, yeah. and um, you might need to have a chat with them because they're actually pushing their work experience towards gyms. Oh, OK. Yeah. Sure. Now, that's so, a good point. So the comment was about Cedar. Um, we have Cedar at our club to just some feedback to you. Great, yeah. Is that um, one of the comments I got back was because it's um, pretty much Monday to Friday, nine to five program, yep. that, that it's hard to get the kids after school hours or on weekends up in the club. Yeah, no, that is common feedback and FFA are working on a national agreement with them, which we won't enter into unless they start expanding that. So yeah. what you'll find is from next year, there'll be a lot more out of hours opportunities available. The kids still have that obligation to do out of hours work experience and they really need to be doing that or they don't get the certificate. But unfortunately, where the where it breaks down is that CETA can't enforce, they, they do that at a certain time, at a certain point. We're, we're changing that through our partnership. Yeah, we're well, hoping for them to run out some more side of it. Yeah, no, we're, we're making it something that um, uh, they will have to do moving forward. They need to be a resource to community clubs. Is CETA only in the metro area, or is no. it in the regions as well? They're in the They're regions. Which regions are they in? So area? the question is, um, where are CETA located? They're in Gippsland at the moment. They're in Ballarat. They're in Bendigo. They're in. They will be in Shepparton. Uh, they will be in Wodonga in 2014-15. From memory, um, they will be in Mildura in 2015. They're going everywhere. They're expanding, and we're trying to put them in places. Unfortunately, in the regional areas, it won't be just football because of the, the lack of numbers. 
Um, so they'll be multi-sport, but football will still be um, uh, represented in those programs as well. Uh, FFB offer free team entry uh, for small-sided football girls teams. That's been going on for a, three, for a few years now. <coughs> Strategically, when you're recruiting girls, do it at the youngest of age groups. Recruit girls only at small-sided football. I can't, we'll talk about this later, but I, putting girls into boys' teams just makes me cringe. I, I can't stand it. It doesn't meet the need of your customers. Um, Girls want to play with their friends. We'll talk about this a bit later on. They want to play with their girlfriends. That's why netball is so successful. And it will take time to develop. And this is the, the key point to trying to get girls as a recruitment platform and keeping them together. This is why FFV's initiated that free team entry at Small Sided Football. If you uh, put in three girls teams, Small Sided Football, you'll get three boys teams for free as well. So it's pretty simple. They're, they're the metro-based competitions. Yeah, small side of football, I think it was 50... Oh, team entry was $50 per small side of football team. Yeah, yeah, so again, if, you, if you're strategic about it, I know Keon Park this year had one small side of football girls team and the boys team didn't cost us a cent for team entries, just the player fees. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we'll go to you in a minute. I was just going to say... It makes you cringe when you combine girls, small side girls with young girls. It's a personal thing. I've got to. No, I understand. Yeah. But in our club, if we didn't allow that to occur, yeah. we're getting new girls at a very young age wanting to do soccer. Yeah. And if we would lose them to other sports, <coughs> if we didn't do that. Yeah, no, I'm not saying don't do it. Yeah. It's, it's okay. And this is why there's no rules or red tape that says girls can't play with boys because we understand we'll probably lose more girls if we do it. Um, but I think what we'll talk about is the, the marketing and recruitment of how we can get more girls. girls playing. Yes, One of the things we did... Um, yeah. It's understanding your customer. Yeah. But she plays with the boys. Yeah. She plays with the boys. She plays with the boys. So you need a space for those girls yeah. as well as the girl that wants to mix it with the boys. And they well, we'll come back to girls a little bit later. Yeah. Sorry, guys. We'll cut because I know James is on at 11.30. We'll, we'll come back to girls a little bit later on. Um, but I will, I will just make that comment. The comment was about girls and development of girls if they're playing with girls only versus girls against boys. Um, we'll touch on that a little bit later in the uh, women and girls presentation as well. Um, we had a dress there, as well. Yeah, nearly there. Getting a bit restless. Um, a League, W League players are available for player appearances, especially the W League because it's managed by FFV. Put player requests in because um, you'll get them. Uh, Especially Hart. Hart wants to get out there a lot as well. So I know Club uh, Victory have Club Victory program where they're pretty exclusive. Um, there was a comment. Yeah. So, do you need to pay for that? Because my understanding is that the FFB didn't have control of the W League, so that they couldn't say that you need to go. No, the W League. Um, so the comment was uh, about the W League players and whether they're available through FFB. The FFB managed the W League team. Yeah. And so we can put requests into the girls to go out and do um, club business. No, no, most of the time they don't. Yeah, it, look, FFB has a budget from state government to invest in the girls getting out to the clubs. So, a great resource for, uh, for young girls to get out to the schools. Yep. Yeah. Just when it comes to um, women's league, would it be more beneficial for the FFB to maybe promote their ball before the, the main event of the men's game, um, being as it's a national side now, um, to have them before, say, Melbourne Victor and Melbourne Heart Day? Yeah, beautiful, beneficial than having them play in a Stadium. So you're talking. So yeah, we're talking about curtain raises uh, for the W League to the A League. Yeah, it's, it does. It has happened. It has happened in the past. Damien Debo and the head of the A League of the FFA has talked about this a couple of times. It's it's more about the uh, the costs of doing that uh, and the um, the sponsor requirements as well around television rights and all these other things. So there's unfortunately red tape around it. But it has it has happened and it can happen in the future as well. It's it's not something that's been put on the shelf and gone. We're not going to do it. It'll happen more frequently as the years go on, I believe. So yeah, it's a great point. Um, 
there's a club workbook around female participation. We'll talk about that later on. Grassroots coaching courses will remain free, targeting small-sided football club coaches. Again, Darren, Anthony, all your ZDOs can deliver those, and there's a greater network. What FFV want to do is have all the club technical directors, so your club technical directors, as, um, as coach educators to deliver these programs on behalf of the game. So I know that in November there will be a, um, uh, an instruct presenters and assessors workshop for club technical directors. By all means, I encourage you, if you know who your, your director is next year, register them on the program. Um, there are school promotional events that take place. Uh, Victory and Heart are the ones that are mainly in the schools through Cedar. I know Victory have put together a fantastic double-sided flyer, which I haven't brought with me, but a double-sided postcard, which is uh, all about promoting playing football. Not about It's Victory branded, but it's double-sided. Boys on one side, girls on the other. Sorry. That's all right. Girls on the other, and it's targeting those particular kids to go and read, you know, go to find a club and find your club to register through the school. So again, FFV and Victory um, split the cost of that one. That'll go out to all the schools from uh, from now to term one as well. Um, talked about it, uh, my football club reporting already. Uh, talked about the club grading days. Uh, school ambassador program and welcome to school promotional material. All things that FFV does to promote um, the link between school and club. I'll let James touch on a lot about this in the next presentation because I'm going a little bit over. Um, Westfield Football Recruitment Days, FFA's partnership with Westfield allows us to be in the shopping centres uh, in January, February, promoting um, grassroots football. So if you're around a Westfield uh, uh, centre, uh, what we do is we try and uh, get your club to actually promote itself at the, uh, at the Westfield Day. So more information on that will come out in due course, but you'll have plenty of notice unlike last year, unfortunately. Um, the finder clubs online, I think that's pretty much it. I won't get into this one too much. All I really wanted to add is that there's a lot of these little initiatives, like the club management program. There's assessment tools, which maybe you can touch on a little bit of them quickly. Um, it's on the FFV club development, club development website. Um, towards the end, we've got a little half hour at the end of the session today. We'll go and put that up so you can have a look at where it is and find it. But yep. there's tools to help you figure out, we're doing this really well, this is where we need help. And then you can kind of be a bit more focused in, in where how your club's going and where yeah. you need to develop more. All right, and the training programs is there's not only limited to coaches, but you know that you've got um, instructing referee programs, you've got assistant referee programs for whenever you don't get your three officials. Um, you've got respect and responsibility. There's a suite of education programs that are available. It's just about um, again connecting the dots. You guys helping uh, FFA, FFA uh, with registration of your officials at your club, your football family, so we can connect uh, these programs to those people and promote them, give them every opportunity to attend. We can move on to James now. Thank you guys so much. Two minutes to stand up, shake, go to the bathroom. I was going to say have a wee. Have, have a wee if you want one. <laughs> um, go to the bathroom, grab some water while we get James set up for his session. Just two minutes, literally. Yes. Yesterday, I think St. Bernard's. St. Bernard's as a school have their own town. Oh, no idea. 
by James is going to be excellent and it will help you guys understand. Manage your expectations. <laughs> I'm going to pump him up. Um, of, of how Active After Schools works with football. Um, please give him your undivided attention. After this, then you're allowed to go and eat the sandwiches. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much for having me along. Uh, so, my name's James Silby. I'm the director of the Southern Zone for the Australian Sports Commission. Uh, I look after Victoria uh, and Tasmania and my main responsibility is managing the team, uh, 46 staff across those two states uh, for the Active After School Communities Program. I know it's exciting to have someone from the federal government coming and talking to you on a Sunday. Um, I'm a football person, I grew up in a, a football family. Uh, my mum was the first captain of the Matildas. Uh, my dad was a technical director with MFA, technical director with OFC, AFC and now with Oman. 
Uh, both my parents worked for FIFA on and off. I've worked for Queensland Soccer Federation, Soccer Australia back in the day. Uh, I was uh, on the board and chairman of uh, Capital Football, which is ACT Soccer, before I took up this job as well. So I know football, I've lived football, I've been a coach, an official, turned up on weekends and listened to people like myself many a time as well. So try and make sure that uh, today's as interesting and informative for you as possible. First of all, why are we here? Uh, why am I here and, and why are you here? There's an outcome that we've got to the Australian Sports Commission uh, around participation. We've got two main outcomes. One's around high performance, obviously, uh, and the other one's around increased participation in sport. For us in the uh, Active After School Communities Program, that's through trying to provide opportunities for ongoing participation in organised sport. So not around structured recreation and things like that, it's how do we make sure that kids have got the opportunity to uh, participate in organised sport. So what are we trying to uh, achieve with our relationship with sports? Now I'm going to start off a bit uh, higher level and then we'll get into uh, some of our specific work uh, with football, but it's just to give you guys an idea of, of what we're doing. We're trying to find out what works and what doesn't work in participation. All those things you try and do with schools or community organisations to increase participation in your clubs, we're out there trying to work uh, to try and find out what works and doesn't work as well. As I said, uh, there's about 46 staff I've got uh, across Victoria and Tasmania. Uh, and what we're about is trying to make sure, what you are talking about that last session, your links with schools and community <coughs> groups, identifying which teachers can be your champions in schools. We've got 820 schools that we work across in Victoria. Uh, and I've got about 30 odd regional coordinators uh, in Victoria who are there working with those schools and local clubs and can work with more local clubs uh, to build those links with schools. So we're an enabling agent. We're a workforce. We've got more ZBOs than, than unfortunately uh, FFE or, or FFA have got. Uh, but we're people out on the ground who are coach educators, understand sport and trying to build links. So we're an enabling agent. The other thing we do is we deliver a really high quality program. So across the country, each semester, we're delivering uh, quality programs to between half a million and 750,000 kids across 3,270 sites across Australia. Uh, we've got kids in schools doing sport. I'd like them to be doing more football, <coughs> but that's my personal view. Uh, so we've got people who are out there running coach education programs and making sure that kids are, are being active in sport. Which sports we choose to work with, a lot of the time is dependent on which clubs want to work with us. So how can we help? Exposure and participation, as I said, whole heap of kids. We've got demand down to a T. We've got kids in that after school environment wanting to participate. Workforce development. So we train up coaches uh, through our community coach training program. Uh, which has got a general principles component that's very similar uh, to the majority of sports, including football. It's really based around a game sense approach. We call it playing for life. That's just our brand that we've wrapped around it. Uh, but game sense is, is pretty, you know, those of you who are coaches, game sense is, is football. Um, and uh, it has been for the majority of the, the coach education programs in football. So we train up coaches to go and do those things. We work with CEDA uh, as well and use those kids to do some of the work. Capability capacity building, we started clubs uh, and we started competitions uh, around Victoria and around Australia so we can work on making sure that more people can play sport uh, and particularly football. Research, we find out as I said what works and what doesn't work. We work with national sporting organisations like FFA uh, to test their products. So if uh, small side football was going to go through a bit of a, a rehash We'd work with clubs and schools to try and implement it to see what worked and didn't work, what the people liked and what they didn't like. Alignment and connections. As I said, these people we've got around Victoria, the 30-odd the regional coordinators, they know their communities. They know about grants as well. They try and get into the clubs. Uh, they know CEDA. They know the schools. They know the teachers. So for us, it's about trying to maximise those connections and, and alignment, make sure everyone understands what everyone else is trying to do. So where are we in Victoria? Everywhere, to be honest. Uh, I know that from the amount of cases I've put on my car since starting this job. Um, so 35, there you go, regional coordinators across Victoria. And these people link with 820 sites. And 70% of our sites are schools 
and about 30% are OSHA, so outside school hour care, like after school care centres. The schools are, are really important. That's where you get the majority of kids who want to be there, as opposed to the out of school hour care centres. A lot of the time are just the kids who are their parents can't pick them up. Uh, those kind of environments. So we are everywhere around Victoria. This is a bit of what's been happening um, in this. this so this is uh, 11, 12, 12, 13 uh, financial years. Uh, so this is the amount of programs uh, that we ran. Positive thing for Victoria up 6% uh, from 11-12 to 12-13. To so that's uh, 530 seven-week programs that were run last financial year uh, for football across Victoria. These are the, uh, the coaches that, that we've uh, had. This is uh, across Australia. So coaches slash deliverers. The real positive for me is we've had a push to get away from private providers. So those you know, for-profit organisations, personal companies, those kind of things, who go out there and run uh, uh, activity for kids. What's great for me is that there's a 21% increase in the amount of coaches coming from sporting clubs. For me, hopefully that translates into more clubs being involved in our program, hopefully greater links between the schools and the clubs, and hopefully that, for, that is about you know, recruitment. It's hopefully more, uh, more kids going into to your clubs. <coughs> and participants. So again, generally across, uh, across the country there's been an increase. Importantly for this group, uh, an increase across Victoria uh, as well. There's a decrease of 48% of the ACT when I was chairman. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> uh, show me the money. You guys, most clubs run on the, the smell of an oily rag. Um, We've got two buckets of money for investment in participation uh, at the Australian Sports Commission. We've got the money that we chuck into to FFA at, an, uh, at a national level. And then we've got the money that we in our program uh, have that we're putting into a grassroots, where we directly invest and inject into that local environment. Uh, both buckets are about $20 million. So the $20 million that we invest into national sporting organisations, FFA, cycling, all these different ones, uh, and then the money that we directly invest, about $20 million through the Active After School Communities Program. So nationally, the Australian Sports Commission puts $916,000, that's uh, this financial year, into Football Australia for participation outcomes. It's mainly for sale. Um, <laughs> so I don't know, you judge the percent on investment there. Um, but that's, that's to help uh, invest uh, value add to, to the, pro the participation programs that FFA's got. Now that's not a, a bad amount of money. This is what we put in in the Active After School Communities Program at a grassroots level to provide opportunities for kids to have a football experience through our program. Between $1.3 and $1.4 million. We've got just under a million going in directly into FFA, but through our program we're putting in more than a million to provide that opportunity at a grassroots level. And for you guys here in Victoria, we're putting in between $350,000 and $400,000 to make sure the kids have got an opportunity to participate in football in that after school environment. Now that's not small money. Uh, a lot of the time that'll be going into schools, but it'll be, cut, it'll be paying coaches, it'll be buying equipment for clubs or equipment for schools so kids can play football. What we are not doing well is making sure that this three hundred and fifty dollars to $400,000 that we're investing into football opportunities in Victoria is benefiting you in terms of recruitment of players uh, or, or potentially coaches as well. The only way we can do that though is understanding where you guys are and if you want to be involved in our program, if you want a share of that 350 to 400,000. If we understand that, if you want to be involved with this, then we can direct those monies towards, towards you guys. So there's an opportunity there. So what does it mean for you? Recruitment retention, what you're talking about today. Players, obviously, we've got heaps of kids out there. You've seen that. But coaches as well. So I know there was a bit of chat about, about CEDA. Talking about making champions of teachers in, in program, uh, in schools. We've got, uh, we train parents, we train teachers, we train university students through our program. We try and link that to the sports uh, coach accreditation program as well. So we can help in that recruitment and retention. 
especially when we've started competitions and we've started new clubs up uh, with the local community. We're obviously recruiting uh, and identifying champions in the community for committee positions and coaching. Capacity and capability. So, as I said, we put money into making sure that the kids have got good equipment uh, and that the coaches have got good equipment as well. And a lot of that time, we're actually giving those grants to the clubs so they've got the equipment to be able to put, uh, put people out there and run the, the programs in the schools. Uh, and coaches. Obviously, FFA, great coach education program. Uh, been through a lot of them myself. Uh, reviewed a lot of them myself <laughs> as well. Um, but our program as well is a complementary program to the majority of national sporting organisations' education programs. So what we're trying to do is make sure that what your coaches out there, uh, your parents, are going through with FFA, we've got a requirement that they, they do some components of our uh, coach education program, but it's a value add. So we're trying to improve, uh, improve the capability and capacity of, of coaches already. Practical perspective. Uh, there's a few things you need to know if you're not... Does anyone actually know their clubs involved in the active up school communities? At the back, a couple... Two out of 80, that's process. rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yep? Sorry, the process is just difficult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, I'll, I'll acknowledge it and apologise for it and then go back to I work for the federal government. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, but it's something we need to improve on. I can, I can tell you, we, uh, we take that feedback on. Uh, one thing I, I can take it on, I'll take it to my national management team meetings, uh, and then it's that process that every one of you has had to deal with the federal government. Um, that process of change just takes a long, a long time. However, those regional coordinators should be there to try and work with you to make it as, as simple as, as possible. And if they're not, let me know. Um, so there is a, a process, and, and one of the handouts lets you know how to, to, to register, step-by-step -step form. I've got a, a bit of information there as well. Uh, as I said, all the coaches need to uh, go through our community coach training program, uh, which has, uh, it's about seven hours. The general principles, if you've got coaches already, they've already done it through FFA. Uh, what we're doing is just talking about our program, and we're doing what this playing for life module, which is game sense, which is just how we organise kids, uh, and how do we keep them all involved and how do we get them to learn through the game uh, as opposed to necessarily standing in lines and passing backwards and forwards for an hour. As you've covered already, obviously working with children check uh, as well. Uh, I've also got uh, on the handouts here is just some contacts if you want to get in contact with our regional coordinators to get your club involved, yes. Are there any particular requirements as regards your coaches, for example, like you know, minimum ages or things like that? 16. Yep. Uh, I just want to give a, a real world example of what uh, AASC, Active Up School Communities Program, has done uh, with football uh, this year. So, uh, a lot of you all know FFA, FFV have got a target towards girls football. Uh, so that came uh, in and uh, out in East Gippsland in, uh, in Bansdale. They were working at the club and identified uh, a need for more girls football. So they got in contact with uh, one of my regional coordinators. That regional coordinator worked with the club and they worked with the ZBO uh, out there to come up and, uh, with a program and they implemented that with a number of schools around that club. Uh, they had about, and I've got uh, the media article that, that came out uh, around it. Um, and what we had was, uh, Sal talked before about getting uh, W League players out. We had uh, one of the W League players go out. We had about 65 girls, I think, uh, end up participating in a, in a gala day. And, and from that, uh, the Bansdale Club, uh, and the, the President talks about it out uh, in the media article, uh, had a, and they've started up a couple of girls' teams now that they didn't have before. Just a practical example of, of what we can do if we know what your club wants to do. If, even if you haven't got the workforce to support a program, work with our regional coordinators to say, look, we want to be involved, we're trying to boost our certain age groups, if you've got that information, certain genders, if you've got that information. Um, and our regional coordinators can sit down with you and make a bit of a plan about, well, when do you want to run our programs in schools? If you're going to do your registration in Term 2, and we want to run a, a football program in Term 1 to kind of get the kids all G'd up 
uh, and then registration happens at the end of that and they can then feed into your season uh, starting in term two. We can work with you. Having 35 regional coordinators around the state means that we can work with you on your specific needs. Uh, we want to know what MFA wants, MFE wants, we want to know what clubs want. Because we only succeed in our program if we get more kids playing sport, and that's more kids playing sport in clubs. So I only win if you win. So, uh, but this is a great example of uh, you know, the club, the FFB, FFA, and us all coming to the party. We bought a bucket of money and some training for coaches to get a specific outcome for a club, and that was around, around girls' football. Uh, for me, that was a, a snapshot of, of what the program's about, uh, where we've been in Victoria, um, and the outcomes we can specifically achieve is that, in that band style example. But I'm happy to field any questions or comments uh, around process and difficulty with, with our program, uh, if, if you've got any. And Anna Hari's just getting the handouts organised, so they'll be going out um, probably over the break, so you'll have them turning up on your, on your page. Are there any questions for James? Yep. I've got one here. Yep. So, it's very quickly. So, if we want to get schools to have a program, yep. contact a regional coordinator. Correct. Right? So, on the handouts yep. that you'll get, there'll be a, a, the, the, step step. Yeah, the step by step process for you to become uh, associated with our program. Uh, then a contact, because uh, I'm not sure where everyone's from, I can't just say these are the, the people to contact uh, with having 35 uh, of the crew around the state. Uh, so there's just a central number you can, you can uh, ring up and say, this is where my club is, uh, who's the regional coordinator that I can talk to, um, and they'll have, each regional coordinator's got about 25 or 26 schools in their region, uh, and then you can start to identify clubs, uh, schools where you maybe already have a relationship, or schools where you'd like to have a relationship that you haven't had one before, and you can sit down with them and have that bit of a, bit of a chat about how that would work. And a final one, so do all the coaches in our club have to do this seven hour Yes. <laughs> so uh, hopefully it's complimentary, though. Um, that if they've done an FFA course, most likely they've done general principles uh, already, uh, which is the online component if they haven't done it uh, anyway. But it's pretty practical. So it's, I see it more of, if people who have already got coaching qualifications, it's a bit more of a PD than anything else. It's just giving them more ideas, uh, potentially introducing them to the, the resource that Sal's talked about um, uh, around the, the work that we did with FFA to develop uh, a whole heap of practices as well. So they're just different practices, you know, warm-ups, main activities, cool-down kind of things that a coach, just to make it easy, you know, this is, I'm going to do a seven-week program and these are the activities I'm going to do. Um, yeah, be careful. Not all the coaches need to do the program, only the coaches that deliver the, the school program need to do the extra uh, education. Not all coaches in the club need to do it. No, 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 absolutely. Yeah, no, only people who are delivering in our program. Yes, sorry, yeah. that's what I was misunderstanding. Thank you. Great yeah. clarification. Yeah, so if, if people are going to deliver in our program, oh, then they right. need to do that, that seven hours. And how much does that cost? Zero. Taxpayer money at work. So, you know, before <laughs> we were saying how to reward coaches could be paying for their PD, you can pay for their PD to do this amazing seven hour course of nothing. <laughs> yeah, of freedom. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and this is the other thing. A lot of coaches uh, or uni students or uh, older, some of your, your senior player, uh, players who are in your senior team who might only be 18 or something like that, they're looking for a, a bit of extra money. Uh, look, yeah, we pay our coaches, um, even if it's an, under an honorarium as opposed to a, if they haven't got an ABN. If they've got an ABN, fine. If they haven't, it's, a, it's an honorarium that we pay them for the, the seven weeks. And if they're good, they're probably going to be working you know, three afternoons a week, seven weeks, four terms a year. So there's an opportunity here, yeah, definitely, for them to, to get some money. James, in terms of starting up, so a lot of people obviously they want to recruit for their the winter season. Yep. So by March, they want to, they want to know what teams you've got. So that means they probably need to have this program in place term one. Yep. Is now the time to organise it? Absolutely. I, I think it's really apt that I'm having a chat with you guys now is once you get the information, uh, and if you're interested in having more junior players, if you're interested in having better relationships with schools, if you're interested in trying to develop a workforce and finding some champions in the community who like football and want to promote your club, get in touch with the regional coordinator uh, and have that discussion saying, this is when we're going to do our, our uh, membership and our registration for next year. We'd like to work in 
a number of schools to try and boost it and it's going to be we're really looking for girls or we don't care if it's boys or girls or after certain age groups. They understand the age groups they've got in those schools and in their region. They know which ones will be best for you. They know where there might be an interest in football already and they just need to have some links, better links with clubs. So have those conversations with the regional coordinator. The more information they've got about what you want and what you need makes their job easier and more targeted about what they can do to, to work with you. Just sort of as, a, as, a, as a feedback stuff, yes. it's active after school care. Uh, we, active after school communities. Really poorly. We, we've, we've, yeah. we've used it very well. We've had a gala day and things like that. Yep. Getting the schools in. But it's a gala hour. Yep. Because it's active after school care. So you can't bring them in for the whole day or for an afternoon or something like that because you're restricted almost. You're restricted to it after school Yeah, care. so we are. We are in that seven week program, we're generally pitched in that after school environment. So 3.30 to 5.30, 3.30, 4.30 kind of time. Um, however, uh, there will be increased flexibility next year. So usually we used to do a, you know, a seven week program. If it makes more sense for your club to smash the school over three weeks and do two sessions a week over three weeks, then we'll do that if there's a reason to do it. If it means that we try and do a day with the number of schools, then that flexibility is starting to be built into the program to, to say, what does sport need? What does a club need? And then we'll work backwards from that. But you're working with a, you know, a government organisation, which is really hard to... Yeah, it is. It's, it's slow sometimes. It turns like Mark Paducah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, the flexibility is now starting to improve from next year so that we can actually run shorter programs that are more intense, or we can have things at the end of the program that really do promote what the, what the club needs. You need to have those conversations with the regional coordinator, and they'll tell you what's possible and, and what's what's not possible. And we'll be as flexible as we can. I think we had one last question at the back. Did you still have a? Uh, yeah, I'm to do back to school, and now I understand what you're doing. Yep. That quite understands where clubs such as the uh, non-victory or hard fits into all that. Yeah, uh, great question, and some work that we're we're doing and we'll, we'll do with FFA as well. Uh, a couple of months ago, FFA had a participation workshop uh, with the A-League clubs and the, the state, federa state and territory federations as well to look at a broader, not speaking on behalf of the sport, uh, to, to look at some broader participation objectives and, and strategies about how they can work better together. Uh, we had a meeting uh, with FFA uh, a couple of weeks ago now to talk about some work that we're going to do with CEDA and with Melbourne Victory. But for me, that doesn't make sense unless we're also working with FFV and we're also working with you as clubs. So what we're trying to do is, so we'll have uh, something happening next year that'll try and tie us in terms of a bit of money, victory, a bit of promotion, uh, and then FFV and the clubs in to try and say, well, we all want more people involved in, in football. How do, how do we do that as a, a team as opposed to four of us going off and doing it separately? And then hopefully we expand that to do that with, uh, with heart uh, as well. Just expanding on that, it's a great question again. Um, we need to have a whole sport approach to football. Um, what I mean by that is that we can't just be um, uh, so, uh, siloed into just thinking about growing the game through participation, but also growing fans of the game for the A-League and for the A-League clubs as well. We want people buying memberships, we want people attending the A-League, we want people buying merchandise, all these sorts of things. Because what happens, more money comes into the game. Um, Importantly, in terms of this sort of arrangement, it means I, FFV, as, a, as an example, is not a brand you want in your schools. FFV means nothing. The brand is you guys as a local club, your brand for that local community. But the brand of the game in Australia is, is the A-League clubs. They're, they're the ones we're trying to promote. We need Victory's brand out there. We need Heart, Heart's brand out there as well because they're the aspirations for, for the game and the kids in the game. We want kids to connect with their heroes and... and uh, their pathway to the top, especially the young boys and the young girls through the W League. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, so why aren't you mentioning the W League? Yeah, no, you're well, just saying um, victory and heart. Yeah, victory, so victory W League. W League. Yeah, yeah, no. Well, big, victory has a women's team. Yeah, so victory brand yeah. W League. No, but I, I mean, you just say A League specifically, and I think people want to promote themselves. <laughs> and we're going to be promoting female. So if I go back to the band style oh, example. Yeah. Uh, there's a goalkeeper, victory goalkeeper, uh, Sandra Moski, uh, there. So that was around what is the right what is the right way to promote 
uh, based on the market you're working with. So this is about getting girls involved in football, so it made sense to get a female victory player out to, to that event to, to promote. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I go back to my mum. She, I've got a stronger woman involved in football, I don't, I don't know. Uh, so if I wasn't uh, thinking about female football, then I'd be getting a flogging. Um, so take your point, but for us, it's what's, what's most appropriate. And we'll work with the clubs to say, well, what do you need? Do you need to promote females? Well, let's get on to yeah. victory. It's not, if it's not limited to the A-League. It, yeah. It's a whole of sport, and it's promoting the girls' pathway as much as the boys. So apologies, no offence. We'll fix all that up after lunch, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing female participation after lunch. All right. Are there any, any, final, last questions? any last questions? Yep. Round allocations. Sorry again? Round allocations. It's so hard to promote soccer when you haven't got the rounds yeah. I'm not going to get into an argument over three levels of government, um, but if I was in charge, things would be easier. Um, <laughs> look, I think, uh, for me, I go back to alignment and connection uh, and the role that I think that uh, we can play. We're not trying to own this space. You, you guys are the ones doing the majority of the work. We just need to be, I've got, as I said, you know, crew on the ground who need to have conversations uh, with councils to say, all right, well, what are your plans? Not for next season, but for the next five and, and 10 years. I go back again to say, it's easier for my staff to have those conversations if they know what your plan is. <coughs> if they know you're trying to plan to grow your club, some, some clubs are quite happy with how many players they've got. Happy days. We're, we're, we're done, we've got our fields, we've got our coaches, we've got our players, happy. But a lot of clubs are trying to grow, and, and a lot of you are here for that reason. Have those conversations with, with my crew, so that when they're having conversations with uh, other, other parts of government, they can talk about, this local club here is trying to grow their junior participation, they're really focusing on girls, or <clears throat> they're really focusing on uh, newly settled migrants, or they're working with people with disability. They understand what your club's trying to do, so they can have those conversations uh, with, uh, with government. I was out doing a presentation to a coach uh, last Sunday um, at Bayswater to a, at a rugby league club and there was a local council there and he came up and said, well this rugby league club needs a new pavilion. Um, I, I just think we need to be able to talk a bit more and understand what each other's goals are. We, we can't, we're not going to fund it, I can tell you right now, um, but we can informally lobby if we know what you're trying to achieve. But if we don't know you're trying to grow and what age group, if we don't know your story, we can't tell your story to other people. The whole idea is growth of soccer, yep. which is growing. But we're running out of room yep. where we can actually put the soccer pitch out there. Yep. We've got one pitch and three hundred and something kids, so you're sharing ground and obviously with Aussie rules yep. to try and push the game forward. Yeah, gr ground allocation, though, is something that takes is, is a long-term planning kind of thing. So again, we're not going to I'm not going to solve that problem for you. But what I can do is, if my guys understand what you're trying to achieve and you understand your frustrations and your issues, and they can help tell your story when they talk to to other people. Um, but I, I take that point. I, you know, I've, I've worked in areas uh, in football where clubs are turning kids away not because they don't want them, it's because they've got no space. And I think there's some work for us to do around better relationship with the education department as well. So Holy the Grounds there. There's the a government system. relationships manager at FFV as well who's all focused on improving facilities um, and managing that council relationship. Uh, and state government and defence has invested a lot of money in strengthening the World Bank <coughs> Facilities Fund over the last few years. Um, and continue to do so. So yes, there's more kids wanting it. I said supply versus demand. Um, yeah, other things you can think of is even partnering with your schools and using school facilities if they're any good, um, especially for small side of football and intro programs. Um, you know, you can fit a lot of kids, 40 kids on a small space, um, half a pitch. I prefer rectangles to ovals as well, don't worry. <laughs> Councils are, are even telling us to limit our training activities because we're ripping the um, fields up. The fields up. Yeah. I, uh, look, I, you guys went through a drought. I went through a drought in Canberra as well, trying to just get on, get on field sometimes, and uh, yeah, difficult. Yeah, I understand. All right. Can you all join me in thanking James for his presentation? <laughs> um, we're 
we're going to break for lunch, but before we do, you've got homework in your bag. You don't have to do it now. But in this workbook, everything we've chatted about this morning, there's things you can ask yourself questions and an action plan of what to do with it. So you don't walk out of here going, that was great, and then fling it away. You can start putting details down of where are we now with participation, what, can, what are our goals? As, as we said, you might want to be happy with your numbers, you might want to grow more women, you might want to grow more juniors, and then start planning actions. So this is, is part of your homework. Um, half an hour or three quarters for lunch? Half an hour, hand up. All right, go eat it. We'll be back in at 22. 22. No, no. We actually finished at um, 11.59, and then we got more questions. Great. Yep, so on here, um, yeah, so it'll have, it'll have uh, our second number. Yeah, let's give, um, right, let's get it straight up. Let's give her a call and say, this is my class in this area. We have the material and stuff that we sent out. We sent it out we run four a year, so this is a four a year, and then next year we we'll run four again. So I don't know whether it's the exact same time as this. So what we do is I send out a survey two or fifteen weeks ago. One of the three things you think you want to learn about or top five things, yeah. and then from that I get the one list, and then I can see which ones are most, you know. Yeah. Um, what? Yeah. No, no, no. Three, or four is now, and then three, or four will be done next yeah. year. In the like the start of year. Yeah. So one or two will be early next year. Yeah. <laughs> No, I don't know. Yeah, there's no school competition yet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, I think have that chat, and again, it's about him understanding, yeah. your, um, understanding what you're trying to do and what the issues you've identified in your local community, because they also work with School Sport Victoria, so if it's around, you think, first thing is there needs to be a school competition, they can work with School Sport Victoria to try and support that, and work with the teachers, so train the teachers up, it's be football, you know, understand football, and then try and get something to happen in the school, and support it through getting demand through our program after um, the school as well. So, look, there's a bit more of a push. I've definitely got a bit more of a push to say uh, the sports that I prioritise, and football is one of them, if they want to do something uh, in a school, then my staff need to support that. Have a chat. So, so we'll be able to control some of it, some of it we won't, but we can have conversations with people to try and get things happening if it's a need. I know how have yeah. the and whether some have like a meeting there to do a presentation and making this on the ground and even if they're you know it might be it might yeah, yeah it might not be uh, one of my staff but they might say, Yeah right, if you're trying to get something in the school then this is this is the this is the person from School Sport Victoria who'd be able to have a conversation with the principals because they are a principal themselves or something like that. Yeah well I've got a great council with Okay. Yeah. I reckon, get on the, I know we're a couple of years later than what you probably would have liked, but have another chat, I think. Yeah, yeah. I'll, um, I'll do that, yeah, because like I said, we all associate with cricket. Yeah. Great relationship with the cricket club, we support each other. Off-season, they put in allocations for every night of the week, but they put Thursday down for us. So we've got personal training. Yeah, brilliant. It's also working hard, which is what we've got. As long as we start the pitch. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, because we got synthetic, oh, right, and yeah, our yeah. synthetic has yeah. got the first synthetic cricket pitch. Oh, you know, oh, right, okay. So it's flat, so we're fine. Yeah, so, uh, yeah I reckon, have, have the chat. Okay. Definitely.
That's, 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 that's a bit of an ambush. That's right. <laughs> no, no, so, so, so we cannot get our coaches to get past that online registration online course. So what, explain that to me. Uh, so, um, so, so in particular, uh, two coaches lined up this season. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, one of them is guy, he, he doesn't even use email. He just yeah, doesn't yeah, use okay. computers. Um, so we're working class area people, yeah. people trade is that yeah. don't touch computers. I can't get them to get past enough on the website to actually register themselves. And Can someone help them? Um, yes. Yeah, so you know what I mean? It's once, it's once, once that bit's done, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's no yeah, more yeah. kind of real... Um, even if there yes, is... Yes and no, but, but it's, it's just a procedural block. Yeah. I reckon, again, uh, the, the, from the, my staff, yeah. they want people to be able to run programs. So yeah, it's for yeah. them. They've yeah, got to yeah. find a workforce as well. Um, yeah. So I have a conversation. I, I think if you've got people who are willing, yep. but they've just got this one block, yep. have that conversation and say, look, we're yeah. 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 happy, yeah, you're yeah, going to yeah. be a good guy. Yeah, yeah. He just, he's not going to do the online. Yeah. For me, otherwise, I'm going to sit down and do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, fair enough. Yeah. That's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just make it easy for the person. Yeah, yeah. Because you've got to work with it. The rest of just didn't seem to be the follow through from the core moment to, to see why we are registered and I spoke to well, well, again, um, I suppose it's the beauty of me coming out on something like that. Yeah. Um, is, you know, you've got my details now as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If there is that, just put me an email. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not about smoking someone on the side of the head. It's yeah, like, no, no. When presented, someone asks me a question, I'll make sure to support that person. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, I'm talking about this atrocious website. Oh. Yeah, the website is dead bad. I'll tell you right now, I don't know what it is. <laughs> 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 you go there one day, you find something, and you leave it. Oh, that's because I have to carry the stuff. Check that baby, you go back. And it's gone. It's gone, or it doesn't leave me. There's something deadly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think um, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's probably common yeah. across our entire Australian Sports yeah. Yeah. website. I, think, I mean, yeah. I've picked on something like that as well, and I took them somewhere really bizarre. As long as they... Um, <laughs> this is not good. They, so, um, as long as they get a receipt, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not surprised, but... I'm trying to find something really fundamental. This is a couple of months ago. Okay. Some legal thing. Oh, right. And there was leaks to it, but they were all in. Right, okay. Um, yeah. No, no, it's, it's like... Yeah, it, it is, but I think we, we've got... What we don't have enough of is uh, the support around that IT. So in our national office, I think we could probably do with a couple more business analysts or IT people to yeah, check all that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so... You can sit on the um, PR, it's just... Yeah. Um, I, I just don't think we've, we've got enough of it. Got our quota yeah. of how many FTEs, yeah. yeah. and we're about to lose 12,000. Yeah, so yeah I, I think having an actual workforce on the ground sometimes it can be useful. Yeah. Um, that you're not trying to ring someone necessarily in Canberra, you've actually got someone who's hopefully not too far away. Yeah. Um, can I ask you a question about a local area? Yeah. 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 I might not know the answer to it. No, no, I just want yeah. to ask you. Yeah. My local school, my son's local school, they're almost yeah. 700 yeah. kids. Yeah. I don't have a sport. That's the same one. Oh, the same one. At all. And the school well, talks about right now has sport focus. Yeah. What they do is they ask kids to put yeah. their hands so up to participate. So the first part was the right. player or whatever yeah. the attention. But there's not a sport day, yeah. and then James. The kids aren't on the. Well, I don't have a sport teacher, yes, and the tennis sports program yeah. comes in. Yeah. But they don't have that. They don't do swimming, they don't have athletics, they just don't do it. And my principal, like if you yeah. ask, is that I. So that was from James. I've asked him and that then now we're going to come to the It's too hard to walk yeah. or whatever. So I'll okay. show why there isn't one. The question of I can listen and choose. So that also depends on what means myself. That means we can see that are actually participating in the sports. So is that something that I'm helping facilitate a teacher to keep the program running and I want my space. So, yeah, it's probably easy to do. And I'm sorry, I mean, we need to have better relationships at the moment. My relationship with the Department of Education but Anna Hari is a good is through school sport Victoria. Sure. So, it would be up to me to talk to school. Thank you. I think I'm going to talk to school sport Victoria because their role is, they work with principals. Yes. Is there something we can do here? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, because it's a different, it's a whole other bureaucracy that education. Yeah, bureaucracy. I just find it really odd because all the other schools in the areas do it, but then what happens is we are actually the school powerhouse in terms of we beat all the other yeah, teams. Yeah, the representative so team, team as opposed right. to the opportunity. But that means that only the there's probably only yeah. 15% yeah. of the kids in the school yeah. actually doing the sport, yeah. which is not great. No. So it's called sport. A school, school sport in Victoria. School, school, school sport, sport Victoria. Victoria. All right, yeah. okay. Thank so you. They're going to do that. They work in education. Yeah, sure. They're part of that. Right. Part of that. All right, thank you. Excellent. I just want to finish with the table. Bike, bike, the bike. Yeah. Just in the back. Who is it? No, I can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to shoot it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can we uh, get Oh, yeah, she's great. <coughs> no, she's... Uh, She's the only person, if I'm starting at 7 o'clock, she's the only person even before me. Um, and she works, she works really hard. I could, uh, I could send her emails. I've got the hours. She replies back to her. Yeah, that's right. No, I, she's, uh, we, uh, when you've got a large workforce, you can have good, you can have good people yeah. and people who need development, and she's, she's an ace, no, ace staff member. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, that's good feedback, and I'll let her know that she got some good feedback. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. Are you sure? Often. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anna Harry's going to get you to email. Presentation. Yeah, I've handed them all out, but I'll review that. Also, I could read you what we're recording for. And I'll try and. That means we can send it out to them too. Yeah. Well done having the run for free. That's always useful when you're trying to get a crowd. That's why I was happy to do this one. Um, all right, you will enjoy the next couple of hours. Thank you. We're nearly done. We're in the right now. Yeah. Right. Thanks so much. All right, no worries. See you See later. See you later. Follow up. Email me on the next week at some stage. It's a bit long in here. I know. It's repeating. It's on or is it just the room? It's just the room and we can't touch. It doesn't have a button. It just happens. Okay. Because it's been cold during the week, it thinks that it's still cold. It takes a day to realise it's not cold anymore. So I asked in the morning, just have a pump. It's all controlled, so yeah, it is. But because there's so many people in here, that's why as well. Yeah, yeah. it's cool. With this um, sheet, I think there's a view from the same club. Yeah, yeah. I only gave one because there was some that the back that didn't get one. So I don't know if that's for the three clubs. Yeah, yeah. Somewhere else. Oh, somewhere else. So that. And yeah, Anna this, this gentleman had a lovely idea. Can the participants get a certificate? Mm, that's what I was thinking as well. We were into that. Yeah. And you've got our logo and stuff. So yeah. Yeah. You completed yeah. yeah. this module and it covered these things. Yeah. That's what I was. Um. That's what we're actually talking about. So. And the people can email. Can print it out if they want to. Yeah. 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 Yeah, just as a PDF, yeah. so there's no cost to you as far as printing mm. most Yeah, because if you do a mail moves and you've got their names on it, whereas yeah. I can't, I've heard of those mm. names. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. The only thing is I need um everyone's email address, because I've only got the person that registers the email That's all right. So if you send, yeah. if you send me send I might to me, send then I can forward it on yeah. to Yeah, that's fine. Um, mm. Participants yeah. that turned up on the day. Yeah, I could do that. Yeah. Mm. That's, fine. that's where your attendance sheets are. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's why I have to go send that through yeah. here. Perhaps rather than right. tick yes, you get people to sign as well on that sheet. It's because you just say yes or we um, initiate. I need to get them to put their email address on as well. Because a lot of them, someone else registered on behalf of them, so. Yeah. Excuse me, sir. Well, perhaps what you should do is make sure that all. Yeah. Yeah. I might just sit through again and, and then just tell everyone yeah. email address if not on it. And also, did you print these? Yep. Oh, really? Yeah. Maybe print them with a handout that's got the three yeah, slides. Oh, the writing? Mm. This is the three slides. Yeah, yeah. There's a three slides per page. Mm. Just sometimes you can see some relevant points and you want to make a note on that particular slide or something. Yeah, and then just
So is the first step to go to the floor? Where is it? Is the name or is it the whole line? Um, we just ran a training session a week on Thursday. We can do focus on um, results
Print your email address as well, please. Do you want a pen? Uh, I don't you have one? Yes. 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 Did you register yourself or did yes. someone else do it? Yes. You did? Yes. 
No, that's not. So I've got email address if you register. Anybody else that hasn't signed in? Yep. getting you all sitting down at 12.41. <laughs> so that's what I'm here for. It's literally just to keep you guys on time and on track. Um, the rest of the afternoon is focusing on female participation. I'll be helping out a lot more with this bit. Um, this is an area that I do a lot of research in and I've done PD with a variety of sports and over the years. And funnily enough, I'm also female, so that's kind of helps. But what I want you to do, um, Sal's going to present a handful of slides in a moment, but what I want to start this session off by doing is with your pen and your paper and your mates around you, or your strangers who are now mates, write down all the reasons why females, girls and women, aren't playing with you at your club. All the reasons why it's too hard to get us, why they don't come, why they don't stay, all those reasons why you can't get females participating at your club. Write them down.
wants to kick us off? Why, why aren't females participating in football? Who wants to yell, yell it out? Females are doing all the work, so they don't have time to go to play. <laughs> okay, so let's just say, yeah, l less free time. Okay. I hear you, sister. <laughs> oh, I've got a very, I've got a hand up here, and a standing up hand. So I'm going to um, the options of netball, um, dancing, and basketball have been around a lot longer than So, traditional female sport. Yeah. Okay, yep. Um, publicity and marketing. Publicity and marketing. So, obviously, not, not good for publicity and marketing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, a gentleman. Um, hopefully, lucky culture, if you're a predominantly uh, men's team trying to attract the start of Yep, very blokey culture. Okay, um, up the back here we were. Okay, so girl, girls, girls can not get along with each other. It's more the physicality of the game because a lot of girls don't like that. Okay, physicality. We're not. Okay, no, no, let me finish. Guys, we're not allowed to judge these statements because they are, some of them are true, no judging. So, physicality? Yep. Coaches? Coaches, thank you. Facilities? Facilities, yes. Whose club rooms have female toilets? Whose club rooms don't have female toilets? Yeah. Okay. My son, Bridge Lanterns, and also. Interested in the community, we're dressing girls like little adults. Yep, so parents and um, culture, just yeah, the community, community culture. culture. Girls don't know they can play football. Very good point. Girls don't, well, they're not told they can. No. Don't know they can or don't, not told. Yep. Um, you know, the servants that come along and they think they're the only girl, they don't want to be the only one. They don't want to be the only girl. Yep. My is often mothers will make decisions for the girls' activities. Yes, we do. <laughs> yep, so the mum, mum, parent choice. But it is mums, yeah. Any other, yeah? Sponsorship and money. Sponsorship and money, yeah. Any others? We don't have a problem getting girls, we have a problem keeping them once they get to 16. Attrition. We will talk about that. It's not so much about recruitment. It's about keeping them. I think about eight, gosh, I don't know how many years ago, Sal. Six years ago, I did some work for FFE on to focus groups with women and girls about why they left. Mm -hmm. FFE has, it might be different now, but then it was about a 40% churn. So if every one girl, so let's just say every 10 girls that were coming in, four were leaving. So you've got actually 1.4 amount as much effort to keep to keep the numbers the same, you know, to keep the numbers the same. Um, team options for older women. There's a focus on young developing females, but older women there isn't really uh, playing opportunities. When you say older, you maybe talking 20 plus or older, older. Older, older. And veterans. There may, there may be veterans. options for um, veteran men, but there really isn't much in the way for veteran women. Yeah. We had one at the back. Did you have a? Yep. Distance for good competition. The two year age groups. The two year age groups. Sorry, Sal, I forgot you're riding the fastest. Don't judge my spelling, I didn't, I didn't study in the tribe, so. <laughs> Any other reasons? Did anyone think about participants more broadly? Remember how I wrote all the types of participants, or were you just thinking of players? Why aren't women coaching? Because I feel like they don't know about the sport. Lack of knowledge? Not given the opportunity. They're not given the opportunity. Because they're the ones doing the front work, you know, they're the ones looking up the canteen and, and you know, doing all the paperwork. And the I'm going to call this, this is my, this is actually a term that's being used now, that we're in the pink ghettos. Yeah. So we do get jobs, but they're in the pink Roles. So we're doing marketing, we run the canteen, we're the secretary. Okay? Does a gender specific club name? Does it what, sorry? Gender specific club a name. A gender specific club name. Can you give me an example? Like Boombank Stadiums? 
Yeah, I don't know if I'm a stallion. Yeah, that, that could actually work, yeah. So it could be, a, a, you know, that no, I'm not a stallion. From back horses sounds a bit naff though, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, at the back. Exactly, so cultural barriers are for some communities. I do, I'm very proud of myself that for the one session where there's lots more writing, I'm not doing it, thanks for that. <laughs> Any others? It's a little demoralising when you have a, a men's game and there's a whole crowd and then the female come on the pitch and everyone just disappears. Okay, so lack of support? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So lack of support, yeah. support, but also of you know facility or whatever. Yeah. Mm. No money. At club level, we're talking, aren't we? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yep. Because they're paying the same rego. They're actually having to basically pay the Yeah. Yeah. When the drought was on, which was when I was doing my work with FFB, um, the biggest issue that the women were saying was that because they had limited time that they were allowed to play, because that tearing up the pitch argument, that they were getting scheduled after the under 14 <laughs> boys. So the clubs were doing. Firsts, reserves, under 18s, under 16s, under 14 boys, then the women were allowed to play. So it wasn't even being scheduled under the men, it was being scheduled under the older boys. So, what message is that sending to your club? Okay, this is really kind of depressing. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're just going to put that on hold, that's going to sit there. Sal's going to present some slides, then we're going to come back and fix it. Okay, so by the end of the next half an hour, all of that will be solved. <laughs> no, not really, I'm not that ambitious. But we're going to have a, have a look at what the uh, researchers said. Okay. Uh, the four Fs, the main reasons why girls want to play... So I, I want These to are in the clear. middle of your slides, sorry. We, we cut them out before, they're in the middle. Yeah, they're in there. Um, I, I just want to be really clear because I know there was a, there was a debate around uh, participation versus development earlier on. Um, what I'm talking about here is getting more girls playing the game. Right? I'm not, not really focused on developing the next Matildas. It's about mass participation, this conversation. So I'm looking at it about how do we get uh, little Sarah who's dancing or playing netball, how do we convert her into a football fan and wanting to play football? Yeah, up with that. <coughs> is this uh, from the FFA research or if you add it to it since then? Um, this is research that primarily was driven through FFV over the past four to five years, to, to be honest, and it's evolved. Uh, this was presented in this form at the club info session earlier in the year. So th there's no new information in here from March. Um, still getting that data from um, Sports Business Partners and Gemba, to be honest, but it seems to be pretty consistent over the three to four years as well. So no nothing new really coming out. Um, 4Fs, uh, in terms of getting mass participation in the game, playing and training with friends, number one. Girlfriends. Girls want to be with their friends, simple as that. Um, family is engaged in the club and cl uh, club activities and the club functions, so particularly mums more involved, um, whether that's on the outskirts watching on with a coffee in her hand or not, at least she's doing something at the club and is, is seen at the club in particular. Um, can be dad too if girls have a great relationship with their fathers. Um, understanding how to make football fun for girls, I'll go into details about what fun looks like as opposed to what isn't fun for girls. Um, and particularly for the teenage age groups and beyond in terms of keeping girls into it, recognising that football's a time uh, for fitness as well as a social time as well. So it's not just all, always about winning uh, uh, yeah, winning and so forth. It's a focus on things that are important to girls as well. Um, what's fun for girls? Uh, especially the older groups, again, the teenage groups. It's, it, you've got to see this as an opportunity for them to socialise with their friends. Times, we talked about time, and it's up on the board up there, less free time. 
we have to compact things together. For girls, what's important, and I can't speak on behalf of girls, obviously, um, but what's important for girls in the research is that uh, they want time with their friends, with their family, they want time for fitness, it's really important. So football offers those things. Let's sell it, let's, let's market that, let's publicise that in our marketing. Football's time to catch up with your mates, time to spend time with your family, time to get fit and get active. Uh, opportunity to keep fit, I've already spoken. Again, this is more around teenagers and keeping the girls in football uh, rather, than, rather than them going to do gym work or whatever it is uh, that they do to keep fit. Be really clear, it's important to girls as it is uh, boys that we're still living healthy, active lifestyles. Let's make football part of that. Let's make football their active lifestyle. Um, and it's about being conducive to their time. So maybe it's less training time. Maybe it's one training night a week. Um, maybe it's not a whole day at the football on, on the Saturday afternoon or whatever it is. So time is important and when you schedule things is important as well. <coughs> For the younger age groups, make it, make it fun. They love listening to music, even One Direction, unfortunately. They love that sort of stuff. Connect with girls. Uh, understand what's, what's uh, big at the time and, and connect with that. Um, have conversations around that sort of stuff. So find out what girls want at their football training sessions, whatever it might be. Um, it's winning's fun, of course it is, but it's not the most important thing. I, I know uh, coaching for Keon Park this year, we played games and uh, the teams that we, we played and sometimes beat, those girls would still rally around in a circle singing their song every week, even when they lost the game. Just because it was fun to do that, they loved doing that. It wasn't important that they lost. It was, it was their thing that they did every week regardless. And it was great to see, I have to admit, it's something we need to do at Keon Park. <laughs> um, uh, let's focus on the competitive elements of football and more on the social. Um, again, mass participation we're talking about here. Um, laugh with girls and their mistakes, don't criticise them. Now, again, self-esteem becomes a big part of this. Um, it's helping them through, getting better at what they're doing. Um, like a lot of people said, confidence, building confidence is a, is a big thing. Um, just to uh, sort of reiterate on that, yeah. um, we've started a girls team for the first time ever and we've got a senior coach who's coming, so he's, yeah. he's they're 14, the girls are 13, 14, he's 18, so yeah. you know there's big age, uh, close in age. But he said the other night to me as where I was locking up, he said, I can't believe it, they laugh the whole time. Yeah. They laugh at themselves when they kick a goal, they laugh yeah. at themselves when they miss a goal, yeah. they just laugh all the time. And if they're laughing, do you think you're going to lose them? But yeah, exactly. And he was really yeah. quite shocked by that. Yeah. He said, I've never played in a team or coach trained yeah. in a team that laughs. Yeah, exactly. And he, right. Like it was really something he had to vent because he didn't, under, you know, didn't understand it. Yeah. But they just laughed all the time. It's a cultural thing. It's it's amazing. Like we we had a lot of uh, great laughs, and that's why I loved coaching the girls this year because it was it was just fun to be around them. And it's just understanding that again, confidence for young girls in particular is a big thing. You need to work on that. They're not going to be um, superstars when they come into the club, so you, you do have to work. <laughs> at a very, um, very uh, low level, I guess, and low base with them and understand what their needs are. And by no means, do not put them with coaches that are going to criticise them for mistakes or verbally abuse them or say, no, no, not like this, like this. It's not about that. It's just about understanding where the girl is at and making them feel more comfortable at the club. So, so the general the comment, your coaches should be like that anyway. Yeah, exactly right. I think right. many boys get a lot out of being screamed at for no good reason. So good coaching practice to be constructive and supportive. Yeah, uh, spot on Emma. Um, some things that came out from research which girls told us they hated, obviously, sustaining injuries or um, our job as, as coaches or as, as a football club is to minimise those opportunities as much as possible. And if they do, make sure we've got good practice in managing them as well. So we talked about first aid training a bit earlier on. Make sure you maybe your coaches or um, other volunteers at your club are trained appropriately for first aid and that you've got the right equipment on board to, to treat anything that happens straight away. Really important. Um, but really simple things, when we're talking about sustaining injuries, even in a school setting, okay, I'll give you this example. A teacher uh, puts on a school football session with boys and girls mixed into it. A girl, young girl never experienced soccer before, um, all of a sudden she's in grade three, let's say, she cops a little kick to the shins from a boy, starts crying, psych psycho uh, psychologically, I can't say that word, Emma, um, 
uh, she's already put uh, football as a bad experience in her mind. It's, it's a negative experience. I don't like football because I get hurt playing football, just from one incident. So it's really important, and that's what we're trying to educate in, with school teachers, that they set up the right environment for kids to play in the schoolyard as well, because what you don't want is for young girls to have a bad experience in the schoolyard, because they won't come join your club otherwise. That's where they sample the sport is so important to lifelong participation in it. So even at your club, if you're getting girls come for the first time because you know dad dad's a football nut and wants these kids to play, they're trying the game. Just try and minimise the opportunities for girls to get hurt as much as possible. Putting them with boys, like I said earlier, where boys are going to run all over them, uh, maybe bully them, push them around, very competitive as opposed to a young girl who might be trying the sport for the very first time. More chance they're going to get injured and hate the game than actually participate in. So really thinking smartly about the. Um, the environment you introduce girls to. Um, again, the abuse, verbal or physical, don't tolerate it. Um, absolutely don't tolerate it. Uh, encourage through your welcome kit to your parents um, complaint processes if they see things like that. Make sure you set up a culture very early on that parents are, are putting in reports <coughs> to you as committee members about anything that might be happening, whether it's another parent or whether it's a coach at the club. Um, that could be perceived as abusive. Yeah, up the back. Yes, I guess the biggest complaint here from our girls is that it's often the behaviour of the other girls in the other team. Yeah, okay. Whether it's just wearing them on the field or yeah. doing things which probably happens all the time when boys match the shirt and tend to upset them. Yeah. So the girls will just pop and come up after the game, maybe all in their eyes back on the way home saying, yeah. she called me whatever or, you know, as we were shaking hands at the end, she said a bad word to me or whatever. That's a really good point. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the comment uh, and the query is about um, uh, building relationships, I guess, with other clubs and opposition teams around girls, uh, girls playing against other girls. Um, a couple of things we did, I guess, as a coach, putting my coach hat on, is whenever we played another side, I spoke to the other coach first and foremost, and, and made sure we were on the understanding of what type of behaviour we were looking at with the girls on the pitch. Um, and whoever was refereeing was to be made aware you know, and talk to the girls about, and boys at the same time, about um, what's expected of them. And if you heard anything like swearing or bullying or pushing or whatever, there would be, there would be uh, you know, some form of punishment for it. It would be, stop doing that now, you can't do that, pay a free kick or whatever it might be, or you know, take, take two minutes off the field or whatever it might be. So it's just about getting together with the other club on the day of a match and just talking about Right, this is what I'm expecting from my girls' experience today. Um, whoever's refereeing, coaching, should also be addressed <coughs> as well about it. But that's some ways we did it. Has anyone else got any other ways that you may have addressed something like that? I know it's a common problem, Steph. Yeah. Most of my girls came out of the year were Africans. Yeah, okay. And the problem I found was the racism that was going on the field. Yeah. I've never heard of here, and I've taught the girls ignore, <coughs> they're only trying to put you off the game, so you're showing you're better than them, so they're trying to put you off the game and they'll do anything to get you off the game. So sing a song in your head or as you're running around the field, sing a song out loud. They'll think you're crazy, they'll keep away from you. And it works. <laughs> 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 and it works, they'll so keep away from you. Good on you, Steph. No, that's so, fantastic. Um, but yeah. the, what you're talking about, the girls, um, we found for the three years we've had them, yeah. The first year was the hardest because they're all African. Um, the other team sort of looked down and said, oh, God, they're tall. The kids are going to be fast. But the second year, we played the same teams again, and yeah. they made friends, except for a couple of teams. Yeah. But then when they went to the under-17 or under-18, that was the hardest one out yeah. because that was us travelling everywhere, not just within the region, yeah. travelling away. Then when they got to that age group, they had to stay home and uh, respect their parents and stay home and babysit and they couldn't play and, and eventually that's gone out. But a lot of them now this year, we've got a bunch of women coming in who have yeah. never played in their life, decided to choose to a, a women's team. Some of these girls are going to be joining them. And they, they're trained now. But yeah. Their coach has told us that we should send a uh, video of them training to play as time videos. And we'll <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great, Steph. Good stuff. Um, I guess on the racism, Kyle, I only addressed that one. 
again, it's got to be something that is um, addressed really early on, especially with young girls and young boys, wherever it's coming from, just to stamp out that sort of culture from continuing. Um, a lot of people won't even realise what they're doing or saying is, is a racist remark. A um, perfect example is um, the Adam Good situation in the AFL. Um, it's really important to, you know, at that point, especially with a young person, without making it public, just that's not appropriate or sorry, don't say things like that because it's, it's hurtful and sometimes it just goes a long way. If it's addressed by an adult, uh, even if it's to the other club coach or whatever it might, especially the young kids, um, it goes a long way in stamping it out for the future. Um, yeah, does anyone, I mean, we'll touch on racism maybe a bit later. What I do know is that FFV is going to um, launch a anti-racism campaign in partnership with Vic Health and the A-League clubs for the start of next year. Um, what I expect to see from that campaign itself is that there's going to be a reported incidence of um, racial abuse in the game because what it will actually promote is, is an awareness uh, of what racism actually is and why it should be reported to be stamped out in the first place. So we know what happens. What happens at FFV and FFA is we don't hear enough about it because it just goes on. Like, did you report any of that throughout the year, Steph? You you've, got a, you've got to call it out. And I think if I can use that Goods example, because it is a good one, yeah, yeah. he stopped. Yeah. I don't know if you all saw it, but he stopped, stopped and off. pointed and pointed it out. You, you, I mean, it was a teenage girl. You can forgive her to an extent. She should have known better, but she learned it from somewhere. But you've got to call it out. Yeah. If you walk past it or ignore it or pretend it's not happening or it wasn't my kid or it wasn't my team saying it's so okay, the more you call it out, the yeah. more people will realise they can't do it. And there, there is appropriate ways, just before you go on, um, there are appropriate ways to re uh, to stamp mm. it out and report it, and that's what the FFE campaign with Nick Health is going to page. You've got to name it. I agree with the calling it out, but... It gives them the satisfaction that you got angry and you walked off the field. Oh, no, no, I'm not suggesting no. that, but you've got to name it. Yeah, when you've got to name it, you say it to the referee sometimes, but it gets to the point where you, the referee, he's all over the field. Mm. He's only one person. Yeah. You can't hear it. Yeah. So don't give them the satisfaction of you being annoyed and stopping your game. Mm. Because they get the enjoyment out of that. Yeah, yeah definitely. What um, FFE has to do better, and I'll make it really clear, is that when you, when you as a player or a coach or someone <laughs> makes a report to a referee about a racist remark, the referee can't have an opinion on that. They've, they've got a duty of care to report that straight away. So they're your first point of contact, either as a player, whoever it is. It doesn't happen enough now. Referees seem to, I didn't hear it, I can't yeah, report I it. It doesn't happen, and that frustrates me because... Regardless, they're servicing you as a customer of the game. They're FFE's representative out on the field. So if you are making a report to a referee, unfortunately, they've got a duty of care to report that back, that someone has made, even though they didn't hear it, someone's made a report into me about a complaint about racism, and they've got to, for us to invest, or for FFV to investigate that further. I was just going to say, with, I think one of the things is that club people need to be educated on the racism issue, which is something yeah. that all clubs have. Now, would the FFV be able to maybe um, do a, some sort of a, a template or a flyer or a, yeah. a PowerPoint presentation that club officials like us can actually sit up there, bring our coaches in, bring each team in, yeah. bring each parent in and basically go through and say, these are the things that happen on the field. These are the things that will not be tolerated by yeah. the referees, the coach, um, the FFA. These are the consequences. So therefore, we're giving you prior warning. Yeah, that's what this campaign, which is funded through Vic Health, mm -hmm. will definitely address and be invested into. So it's, it's a great that point. We can then yeah. be able to put to. We probably should go back to the topic of female and not racism as such. But um, a com yeah, comment about. And just um, if, when you're doing that, you can just put in clear processes. The, the different kinds of different avenues for players versus spectators versus managers and things like that. Yeah, no, that's spot on. That's exactly what this program will cover. So, yeah. no, spot on. All right, we'll move on. Uh, the last point there. Yeah, really so, yeah. Um, would that include like, or like just discrimination generally? Is that what it's aimed at, or is it just? Yeah, it, it's. It, it, look, just the, the campaign itself is because it's through Vic Health. It's about um, um, racism in general, <coughs> but you can apply the principles to. Referee abuse or spectator yeah. abuse—it's pretty simple stuff. Yeah, it can easily be translated. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, we, we will move on conscious of We're time. We're going to have some more free time at the end where we yeah. can workshop some other stuff, so we'll park that and keep going. I hope that was my water. Um, <laughs> standing, standing out in the cold or wet again is another thing that's not fun for girls most of the time. Um, so if you do have a partnership with a, a local uh, facility, take them in there if you can. Um, some, some uh, Through council you might be able to get something for free as well, so it shouldn't cost you anything. But try, again, try and minimise the things that might not be as fun for girls as they would for others. Um, in terms of implementing what we've learnt through the research, one of the key points is the younger you recruit them, the harder it is to actually lose them. Girls, girls are probably very, uh, not probably girls are very loyal. Um, if they if they like something early on, they'll want to continue to do that. But not just girls, but their whole family. If mum loves it and can see how happy her daughter is, you're more likely to keep them in. But the younger you get them, the more likely uh, it is that they'll continue to do that. So you see that with dancing, you see that with other sports as well. So making it a uh, fun and enjoyable experience as young as they possibly are. Usually you get them around seven or eight um, is when you start to get girls uh, interested in football because they've sampled it in the school setting uh, or, or dad or mum, whoever it is, might be a football person that might have introduced them to it. Um, the harder it is to keep them if you're providing them with the right experience at club level. Um, like I said, mass participation focus. Try and minimise the interaction with the boys at the club as young as possible. Um, structure your training and your games at different times and away from the boys. Um, it, like we said, we're talking about two different customers. Boys are very competitive and boys are stronger no matter what age. They'll run all over the girls. Um, girls want an environment which is, which is suitable to their needs and gets them to build confidence in themselves and that they're enjoying with their other friends there as well. So like I said, you will have exceptions to the rule. Most definitely, there will be girls that maybe a sister wants to play with their brother or whatever it might be. We have girls that want to play with boys, and sure, cater for that. I'm not saying don't do it, but it comes back to understanding your customer, your individual customer. Understand their needs, ask the question beforehand. Um, we your talent you, girls. Yeah. The girls on the talent pathway are we the ones that will be happy to play with the boys because they want the higher level yeah. of competition. And as a coach... If they're just having an a injury level hit and kick, yeah. um, then, then no, give them their own safe space. They'll, you'll be able to see very clearly which girls will mix it with the boys and which ones won't. Yeah, exactly right. Great point. Um, and, and it's up to the coach as well to be, um, uh, I guess, privy to that just by uh, spending their time with the, with the kids in general, um, which girls can match it with the boys and be, I guess, challenged against other boys and even older age groups. We, we had a... Um, Sorry, just say that one rule is that girls and boys legally, I think the AFL case is probably the one that drew the line in the sand, yeah. um, girls can play with boys legally up until the age of 15. So you can't exclude a girl playing with a boys team yeah. under the age of 15 because legally they've been said that the physicality is not different. I was this tall in grade six. Yeah. Um, still taller than Sal now, yeah, so we probably <laughs> should have mixed up at this age. That's a very good little thing. Sorry. Um, so just got to think about that just because it doesn't get until that bit older that all of a sudden the boys get stronger and fitter. A lot of girls at 12 are the back row of the grade six photo. So just remember that, that the physicality stuff legally doesn't come into play until 15 now. Sorry. So sorry. Is it when they turn 16? No, no, the year they turn 15. So 14 and 11 months they can still play with the boys. When they turn 15 then they're going to, um, then they're not allowed to play at rep sort of yeah, level sure. with the boys. So you mean you need to stop them at 14 so they're playing in the 15? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the point that's been tested in the courts, is where that sort of that's line being drawn. So I'm just going to ask, you say you're going to train with the boys, which obviously I think that's very true. You say that any game is a different time, so that feels quite difficult. Is there a problem with the game? I, I, yeah, I put it a slash. It depends on how you call it at your training uh, game. So, yeah, if you can, and if you can request it from FFB to have them at different times as such, then fantastic. Yeah. So what? I guess the point there, we, we made this point with Gippsland and Geelong, where we were trying all this girl-only small-sided football with modified playing formats, um, was that we'd actually have, you know, a 10 a.m. time slot at one venue where it's girls only small sided football, um, so there's no other boys around, it's girl time, whatever it might be. Um, uh, and that seemed to have worked okay in Gippsland anyway, it's working pretty well. And that's separate to when the boys or the mix might be playing, just so it's a more conducive environment to girls that haven't got boys 
on the sidelines pointing and laughing or carrying on, whatever it might be. So. <coughs> Why is this a problem with soccer? You know, girls... It's not a problem with soccer, it's a problem with sport. Is it really, though? Yeah. Because, you know, girls stay at baseball... Uh, no, or... I've had this exact same conversation and exact same research with cricket. And cricket's problem is even more so than football because cricket's yeah. a technical... A, a more technical sport because you've got to learn batting and bowling and fielding and, you know, like, there's more than one bit to learn. Um, and you don't stay at... Master. Like, anyway. Master. You yeah. don't play it till later. So cricket's got this plus-plus... Um, the AFL's got a lot more money and strategy in developing their women, but they're still really struggling with keeping them. There's lots of girls going to Auskick, but they're not going into club. This is a sport problem, except for netball, dance. Base, well, baseball doesn't have this problem. So or involved, softball. Yeah, we're yeah. involved in In terms of recruitment of girls, is that the problem yeah. you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, because they're the traditional... Really involved with fencing Victoria as well, and we don't have this problem. Traditional female sports. Fencing I think um, the, the biggest thing for us has been about the culture of clubs and the, you know, there's a mindset, especially you know, 10 years ago maybe, more so than there is now, around uh, we want our boys or our senior men to, to win a premiership and we'll focus our energies on that. And I guess it becomes how do we recruit the next generation of senior men to, to win the title. It's, uh, a lot of those senior men focused clubs was about the VPL in, in Victoria. Um, as an example, it's about winning that title because there's more prestige about winning that. So set, let's set up our club to to achieve that in five years' time. And so it becomes a cultural issue around it. Um, it doesn't look like us. It's on the board, second class citizens. We a lot of the time with clubs and conversations I have is girls as an afterthought. It's not trying to be discriminatory. It's oh, if we get girls, fantastic. We'll get girls, but very few clubs actually go out and actively try and recruit girls to their club. So, it's, uh, like I said, it's, we're, we're, not, we're not discriminatory, we're not closed doors. If girls come, fantastic, but have you actually gone out and marketed to say, yep, we, we, we want a girls-only team, you know, girls-only photos on your flyers, you know, hitting girls uh, in the schools-only programs? A lot of it doesn't happen. It's a, it's a nice to have girls at your club. Mm -hmm. uh, up to that, yep. um, I actually went out uh, last season, uh, went to every um, primary school in Casey, Exactly right. So what you'll find is from FFA and FFV is you're going to have tailored marketing now. So you're going to have boys only marketing and girls only marketing. Um, so flyers and so forth which target girls specifically. I think it worked well for us at Keon Park where we went out to the market with girls only uh, images. We, we hit up all the reasons why girls would play football. We encouraged them to bring their friends along and so forth and it worked pretty well. First first year of having juniors in 10 years and 15 girls were at the club. So I think I have to bring this up, Anna, actually. Yeah. Anna and her, her partner, first year committee members, um, I remember seeing with, with her husband, John, at the start of the year, and we were struggling for girls at that point. I think we had, we were three short. And then John said, oh, I've got three daughters. <laughs> I was like, well, okay. And they're perfect in our age groups and they play out their first season of football and were there every week and I think loved playing football this year. So... But this is, again, that culture of... I think John never thought about his girls playing football, and probably neither did you, Anna. So, yeah, and that's probably a great example of, of what's happening. It becomes a, an afterthought or, oh, shit, you know, yeah, we can get girls in the play. I've got another idea that I'm going to do next year that I want to share with the room that I've actually um, going to create a girls only sponsor pack because, so, for the girls' team, because we have two, um, Afri it's all African girls in the team and both their parents work. Yeah. So it's spoken to local businesses, so there's going to be a few little things in there, like just things that girls of that age really need. And I know that sounds odd, but it's like join the club and here's your girls only soccer pack. Yeah. I'll let you know how it goes at the end of next year. Ah, sounds great. Yeah. How successful was that lady that hit the schools? How many did you get? How, how successful? Um, well, we ended up with a number seven, a number nine, a number eleven, and a number fourteen. That sounds pretty I'll good. I'll call that successful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what was your approach? Was it girls only activities in the schools or 
Sorry? Was it girls only activities in the schools that you went with or well, was I it marketing? Went specifically yeah. girls. Yeah. Um, and explained their policy for the other way to use that um, sort of to, to bring them in. Yeah, um, yeah. But yes, predominantly just girls only for marketing. Yeah, um, great. And this year I hope we get to explain it because I've now never to get into the council. And yeah. Fantastic. One yeah. of the things to think of too is we think of women like we do with culturally and linguistically diverse or disability. We're not a minority. <laughs> we're actually half of the population. Women are not a minority special needs group. We're half the population. Actually, I think we're 51%. They're actually the majority. <laughs> so I think when we frame this stuff in sport, we go, there's a special needs group. So we've got the disability and we've got the cold and we've got the, you know, these... And then we've got women, and it's like women are not this little special group that we need to take extra. They're, it's half of the population. So you're missing, if you don't have a strong female stream in your club, you're missing out on half of your local community. And again, I'm going to spread it to the bigger participants, they don't all have to play on the field. Yeah. Um, just if it's like the gentleman that spoke before, he spoke about after school programs. Yeah. Does he ever think target physical education teachers? So that soccer is part of the regular syllabus? They're so not they're allowed. Pardon? Education department rules on what is in PE yeah. are very right. tightly controlled. So sports can get involved in schools, but they yeah. can't touch the PE curriculum. Yeah, so I will I'll touch on that a little bit, though. Um, there are... Sorry to cut you off. I'll, I'll come back to the rest of it. Um, we are going to start doing that better. So I mentioned on the previous slides uh, a school ambassador program, which I talked about. So that... That is a registration portal for school teachers to get resources on football about how to set up football better in schools as such. Um, and we are actually working with the Asian Cup team on a legacy piece for the game, which is uh, an education resource which is tied into the curriculum. Uh, it'll be branded Asian Cup for 2014 as we head up to the Asian Cup, but it'll be rebranded as an A-League resource, which is all about uh, yeah, targeting, using teachers to deliver Education uh, outcomes in a football sense. If that it's makes sense. Is a physical education yeah. organisation, and you can do a yeah. TD there. Yeah, we do. We work with Ashburn pretty closely uh, at FFV, and I know we're presenting to all teachers at the conference at the end of the month or end of November, I think it is. So there's a few different things. Yeah, we definitely target teachers for professional development in, in all ways. We just haven't done it as well as AFL and cricket, just because of money and resources at the moment. To be quite. Honest, yeah. Up front. Rob, well, just sort of a silly question, but are we just talking about a numbers game that in the, in the special needs group? We, we just don't, we don't have the numbers. So what hits us in the overall population is at an age sort of 13, 14, the participation group of kids drops off in, in lots of ways because of competing yeah. schools and things like that. That hits us much harder with the girls. There is a teenage girl drop off phenomenon. Yeah. That you, that all but boys Yeah, but, but all sports are battling against. What I can tell you confidently with my researcher hat on is that football, this football, is a bit worse than other sports. Yeah, but, but I think just... So it's not... It's, it's, I think it's snowballs, it I yeah. think it snowballs because of the numbers. Yeah. That we, we then also, we don't have a team. We're in the boys group. Yeah. We may still have a participation team and a competitive team. Mm -hmm. In the girls group, because of the smaller numbers, we don't have either. Yeah. Which then said, well, no, I'm not going either. So I'll, I'll quickly put something up because you make a really good point and I'm going to try and highlight this a little bit. Um, Anna Hari has written all these down, so yeah. we'll be sharing the notes later. So let's say the participation graph, so we're saying our sport peaks at younger age groups, so we'll call this age. Um, no, we won't, we'll call this age, I'll call it age. All right, so what <laughs> happens is there's more participation, this is participation, so there's more participation as we get younger and as we get older, like you're highlighting, you get into your teenage years, and all sports are declining, and sport, football more than most. What happens at this age group? We ask for four-a-side football, we ask for seven-a-side football, we ask for nine-a-side football, mass participation. Now we're asking for 11-a-side football, where there's less people playing the game. Does that sound silly to yes. most other people? Yeah. So my point, especially with girls, why are we doing 11-a-side football at 15s, 14s, 15s, when, less, when more are leaving the sport? Why can't we structure the game to suit what the customer is telling us? Why can't 15s be seven aside football? Can you think of another very traditional male sport that has got a long version of the game is cricket? Girls cricket for teenagers is Friday nights and it's a 2020. 
that's the only real teenage that they can go into a women's club when they become women. Yeah. But it's much more traditional men. It's even harder in cricket than it is in, in football. And they've gone, okay, let's just. They've got three different versions of the game. Yeah. I think that's what Sal's saying. When you get to 15s, yeah. there's really only one version of the game again. Yeah. That's not meeting. So what's the happening? Needs. Yeah. What's happening at club level? It's come back to us a lot. Is some clubs are trying to be proactive, increasing their female participation, and they're getting seven, eight players at 14. They can't get the last four or five players, so. Oh, sorry, we, we can't have a girls team. So the girls leave the game and try something else. Or go to futsal. Or go to futsal or do something completely different. So you're actually, you're trying, but you're not getting the numbers required. So, so I, I guess... Are you to introduce a girls set aside? Yeah, I think if the clubs lobbied enough and said, look, we want to, we int we want to introduce this and we'd support it. Because FFE kind of works to service you guys as the number one customer for FFE. So if the customer is saying, we want this, we think this will work, FFE will introduce it. And don't even think about girls. What about women? Women might yeah. play a seven aside. Yeah. Yeah. I've got the women that have never played before. Yeah. And I'm not going to go and play an eleven aside game. Yeah. So, so I guess I this is. I couldn't run the, the length of the pitch yeah. without falling over. <laughs> <laughs> By all means, you're going to have competitions. I'm a swimmer. I don't run. <laughs> you're going to have competitions which are 11 aside football because you want to keep your talented girls playing as well. But we also want to introduce mechanisms which recruit new girls to the game as well. So. I think in Geelong we had a, I'm not sure if the gentleman from Geelong who's here, who else is from Geelong? Anyone else in the room from Geelong? No? We introduced, uh, I guess, a pilot concept in Geelong this year and I think they're under 13s, correct me if I'm wrong, 14s, a seven aside football in Geelong for girls, yeah. And it works pretty well. And if they went to 11 aside, it wouldn't work. You wouldn't the have, you wouldn't have girls' the, competition. The only thing that's gone to 11 aside is the seniors. The seniors, exactly right. I think even your 17s. Because yeah. the skills and the technical stuff, you're still learning well, in a smaller well, version. The other thing with uh, seven aside, because they're on a smaller mm. pitch, mm. Yeah. all of a sudden their skills are going to develop a lot more. Yeah. Because yeah. you don't have that much room anymore. Yeah. You haven't got the time so, to get away from the stacks you would on a big thing. Yeah. So one of the things we're trying to advocate, I guess, or I'm trying to advocate at FFA as well, is to even look at the small side of football playing formats for the young kids. And whilst they might be good for the boys, maybe you're even struggling to get seven aside uh, under nine girls together. So maybe we need to look at that and go, well, maybe we have to make under nine girls five aside, or whatever might be easier it is to get more girls playing. Again, things to, food for thought. And your That's talent girls will still go in with your boys up until 15 anyway. Yeah, you wouldn't so stop. So your talent that, yeah. girls are still going to be playing on that talent pathway yeah. anyway. But that's got to come from you, not from us. That's right, yeah. You've got the research. Yeah, yeah exactly right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You can't wait for us to say, oh, you know, perhaps this should be seven aside under 15s. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's a yeah, fair point. Yes, yeah. yeah. You, you need the leadership to dictate that. That's fine, yeah. Yeah, can I just support that? That say, well, this is what we need to do. Yeah. I'm sure everyone here, if we're just struggling to run our own clubs with the spare time we have, they say, oh, I believe you really need to lobby the FFB for them to offer programs that will increase participation, which is in FFB's best interest. Why are you saying it should come from us? It should be from FFB. Yeah. They're saying, okay. we're going to offer this program, who wants it? Yeah. No, it's a great point, and I'll take both points on. I think everyone shares it. So, um, the, the, the only reason I'd give you is because I think we're a customer service uh, organisation and customer satisfaction is I think F what FFB measures themselves on more so than anything. So it's about trying to keep more people happy <laughs> as, as much as possible. No, it's, it's a very good point. <laughs> so no, no that's a fair, fair point. So we'll, make, we'll take note of that and, um, and actually do something with the research I think is what you're saying. Up the back, yeah.
a great point, yeah. And it's just such an inequality. Yeah, I think Anna Ari's made that point around, especially around gate keys and so forth. Um, one thing I will say is, um, and I did end up this conversation. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a fair point. I, I will make just the one point, I guess, on that one. Um, at, and I did have this conversation at lunch with someone. At the elite level, uh, there is obviously great opportunities for girls to earn a living from the game. And I think what we need to do better is actually get those girls... Uh, to come back and talk to aspiring athletes, aspiring footballers, young girl footballers, um, to tell them about the, you know, their life experiences in the game. And I know Kaya Simon, who's recently just done her knee, um, she'll have a bit of free time in the next 12 months to go out and visit some clubs. And she, she's in, in winter, she's in the US playing football for Boston Breakers. And in summer, she's playing for, well, this year would have been Western Sydney Wanderers in the W League. Um, football's a lot. She earns a living through football. She sees the world through football, and it's not just limited to her. A lot of the girls do it. I think what we need to do is put them out, uh, put them on the platforms, and tell them to share their stories with aspiring young girls. That there is a pathway. There is a way to earn a living, unlike any other sport um, for our for our girls. Let's well, yes, take sir? one more question, then we'll yeah. roll on. Just to compliment what you're saying, um, I understand where she's coming from in that comment about you know, the money and all that sort of stuff. But you'll never get it. You'll never be able to pay the girls uh, in the same way until the crowds start coming in because then you've got that and the sponsorship behind it because that's what really revolves the club around being able to pay players and, and generate money out of the canteen that will, you know, you're rolling out with 4,000 people that are around. It's one word, it's called a double header. And, and when you get a girls game, you're lucky just to get parents and a couple of friends that roll up. And, and yeah. you're not going to be able to generate the... But if you fixture it as a double header, then they've got the same gate and they can share it. Yeah. That's one for FFE, Anu. <laughs> All right. Yeah, um, we need an equalisation. We will, we will move on. Uh, relationships do matter, especially with the coach. Um, I can't stress this enough. It's, again, coach, it's another thing about coaching. But the, the interpersonal relationship with a girl is different. So it's, especially we're talking small-sided football, maybe less about technical development and more about coaches actually caring for the young girls and, and young and young kids um, and actually taking an interest in their day-to-day -day life, listening to them about what happened at school today or whatever it might be, just developing that bond, um, really important. And that's one of the key differences, I guess, between boys and girls. Girls value a relationship with their coach on a personal level more than a boy does. A boy might be looking for that technical development Girls looking for friendship from their coach as well. So really important. You put the right people in with your uh, with your market. Um, and time's valuable. Uh, again, mainly for the older guys. There's priorities in life, school, work, family, and so forth. And this is the point I made earlier. Um, football time is fitness time, and it's family time and social time. Let's try and, and promote that better. Um, club actions. Uh, nominate a committee member uh, to drive women and girls strategy at your club. Is there anyone in leadership position on the committee that's saying, yeah, I'm an advocate for girls' football and I'm going to take responsibility? Great. That should be on the agenda. Should be, a, should be on your uh, committee meetings uh, on a monthly basis. That person's the spokesperson for it. So really important that the club must take ownership and leadership at the committee level. Yeah. Uh, we're in the Ballarat League, and that's where all the clubs in the Ballarat League have got together, and we've been discussing that. And we also want somebody in the, in the Ballarat League to be person that the female coordinators yeah. as well so that they're responsible so this responsibility coming all the way down the chain. Someone like Laurel Summers? <laughs> she's, she's just been nominated. Oh there you go. Um, female leadership across the club so uh, like Emma's saying you know it's not just about you know you want to get girls playing the game well they need to see the champions of the club they need to see <coughs> mum either coaching or team managing or again women on committees people that they can aspire to be like at the club um, around them. So there's a workbook that was um, developed. Which is in uh, your pack. It's in your pack. Uh, it's the female uh, participation workbook. Gives you a chance to uh, evaluate your club, I guess, uh, in terms of what it's doing to meet the needs of girls and becoming a female friendly club. Um, do, do a strategic audit. Um, fill it in. See how you go. See where you're at. And give yourself some goals to achieve using that. It was developed uh, over two years with the Ballarat University um, through some research there. So it's, a, it's definitely a, welcome, a great tool to use. Um, welcoming facility for women, particularly mothers. Uh, 
that again, it's a cultural thing. Make sure think about things uh, around your club, and your your workbook will allow you to think about those things strategically. The best example is put toilet paper in the girls' toilets. Yes. Yes. Comes back a uh, hell of a lot. Yes. But I want okay. smelly uh, smelly urinals. Clean either, the so toilet. You know, yeah. make simple things. Stuff. Yeah, make it make it a, a female friendly environment. Exactly right. Um, women and girls on the agenda at community meetings, I've mentioned that already. Um, celebrate female participation as you would male participation at your club as well. So put the girls on a pedestal, put them in your weekly newsletters or your monthly newsletters, put them on your Facebook pages, celebrate everything, everyone who participates at the game, um, as you would uh, the, the guys at your club as well. Um, and we talked about the, the relationship with your schools and a great example out of Casey over there. So strategic about if you're going to grow girls football, target girls at the school, talk to girls at the school with specific marketing for girls, put photos of girls playing football so they can see themselves playing football um, and understand it, speak to mum in that communication piece, really important. Okay, this is the last slide I'm told, good. Um, like I said, so, some action items, start thinking about girls early small side of football teams. It makes financial sense for you guys more than anything as well. Girls only programs. I think uh, on the south, on the, out in the south, uh, there's a couple of ones. Chelsea, I think, implemented a, what they call the Mini Matildas program for young girls uh, over the last few years, and it's had about 30 plus every every year. Um, again, maybe small sided football isn't the right product straight away for a young girl. So, an introduction to, to football for girls, a training program might be better for them. Uh, depends on which age groups you're targeting. Uh, female friendly training uh, and kickoff times, we talked about that a bit earlier on. Think about your competitors. Think about what netball are doing, what time they're playing, um, where they're recruiting, dance, what they're doing, what time again. Don't, try not to go up against head to head with your competitors, especially the big participation sports, because you're not likely to win that battle, particularly in regional Victoria. So, Find out about your competitors and try and target, you know, girls will play more than one sport, they'll do more than one thing. So maybe you can find um, <laughs> slots around these around these time slots as well. It's easy to get, you know, a netball team, it's easy to get a whole netball team over to play football as well as playing netball. You get a whole group of friends playing both sports, it's fantastic. Um, accessibility, again, think about, value it. Um, what should it cost, should it cost the same as boys? How much time do you want to give girls at your club? Um, depends on the age groups and so forth, but you know, two training sessions a week for small side of football plus a game on the weekend, is that too much? Given times of the essence, especially for parents, what parents are telling us is that they'll spend more time and more money on their boys but that, than they will their girls as well. So even parents are doing it. So maybe you have to make it more time friendly for, for parents to think about getting their girls involved. Uh, and we talked about targeted girls promotional as well. So that's that easy. Any comments on this one, guys? Can you, you guys just clarify um, with, with what was said before? If the girl's 15, so she can or can't play on a boys' un team. Under 15, so 14, 11 months and 30 days, she's allowed to play with boys. I was the team manager of under 16's team this year, a boys' team, and we challenged another team that had a girl in there. If she was 15, should they have forfeited? No, it, it's just basically, put it this way, it's been done in court for the AFL, so both other sports then fell into line because went through a court case of a girl was challenging why she wasn't allowed to play with the boys. She was equally able, and it was just, a, okay, well, at what point does it become dangerous? Look, to be honest, the, other thing the is feminist in me will go, at some point in the next 10 to 20 years, it will become a null yeah. thing, because there are girl, we know that there are girls that could wipe the floor with some boys at the age of 20, let alone, you know, it, it really should be on ability and size, well, not on whether they be applying the FFB to get dispensation and do that? Yes. Yeah, they would yeah. be, yeah. And so the, the, the first point of call for a club is to check the FFB rules of competition around girls' participation. Um, I don't know them off the top of my head, I'm on the competition. Same they found <coughs> they can play on a, in under 14s competition. They can play under 14s. In under 15s, you have to have a, a special letter from FFB allowing a girl to compete in, in the comp. Okay, no, that's but great. You would that's... Only, I would imagine you'd only be complaining if you thought she was giving them an unnecessary advantage. 
Because we, we didn't feel there was a problem with it. That's why mm. I... Uh, that's mean, if you don't, if, and I can't imagine many cops going, that team's got a girl in it, they're going to beat us because there's a girl. And she was, she was a good player too, and we <laughs> were happy with it. But, I mean, that's I mean, good, good on it. If it gets to that point that she's a brilliant girl and she's going to beat... Yeah. But, yeah. No, I think it's sometimes the boys themselves, they just don't Got want to go tackle, tackle, tackle yeah. hard, they don't want to hurt the girl, and then sometimes they pull back. Yeah. Coaches point. then jump on the boys and say, hey, you've got to play properly. Mm. But you can't, you just don't want to hurt the girl. I you recommend... Do, you do second thing Man, isn't there a case now at the NTC girls, I mean, I think the under-16s is there, that play against the under-15 boys? Yeah, I think you're right. How is that, I mean... It'd be because literally... They're on a talent pathway. Because remember this, this map of the... But if we've down, got legislation basically saying that 15 to... What, blah, blah, it's blah. only been tested in the courts when someone challenges. So if you were having a social kick and it wasn't under the auspices of an official competition, you could have anyone playing anyone. But they are playing official competition. Yeah, it's because they need that level of competition because they're on a talent pathway to get picked for W so League Internationals. They might have got compensation they're down the level. The girls are effectively age. playing down the level. Yeah. Down the age. So they've, they've got no... The idea of the women not being allowed to play in the older boys groups, the girls being in the older boys groups, is because so they don't get hurt. If you've got older girls playing younger boys, then that disadvantage that the men have, boys have by being physically stronger and more able, is discounted. Because I would imagine if the boys, the under 15 boys, know that they're playing the NTC girls, they're not going to worry about tackling the NTC girls. Because they're going to know that they're going to be able to mix it. So it's that the girls are playing down, not the other way around. But it's the competition, otherwise you're not going to get the competition. No, no, I might get that talk. Yeah, 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 up the back. Because, uh, to go back, whether they're playing for boys, what if you have, there's some guidelines in terms of ages of girls. So if you have a girl who's 10 years old, we're going to play technically. Um, what if her parents wanted to play on the 14 team, for instance? If she's able, if it's on merit and ability, then there's nothing stopping that. As long as it's on merit and ability. If you would pick her in your team, then pick her in your team. So there's no guideline? What if she gets injured? Same as any other kid getting no injured. Legal, no legal ramifications? If the parents have consented to it and it's FFV's approved it, I guess it's part of their competition, um, then, yeah, it's... it's... the same as if you put an under nine boy, a nine-year-old boy up in under 14 boys. It's the same yeah. thing. There would be something in FFV. Yeah, you really, I mean... I think it's FFV rule specific, yeah. yeah. It's only in under 18s and senior level. Okay. Yeah. So again, you have to have a... You, you actually can play... Uh, we have some 15-year-old girls playing for senior teams, yeah. but uh, you have to have a special uh, uh, dispensation from FFV and uh, the doctor, the, uh, the teacher, and the parent consent to it. So it's not the underage. No, so if you're on a committee of the club... Uh, and a grandmother decides to sue the club because the, you know, the commissioner said, how, how, how can you allow a 14 year old, uh, sorry, a 10 year old playing a 14 year old competition? But it's parental consent. So yeah. the parent must consent to that first. That's the whole point. If the parent says, we want this, and yes, I'll give it to you in writing. As someone from the country, I think everyone ever always yeah. played up two up extra games because there was never enough bodies in the town to fill all the teams. Yeah. So under 16 boys would also play to the seconds. Because that wasn't otherwise, it wasn't so going to be. Are you saying the responsibility lies only with the parents? Yeah. To as long as they're picked on merit. If you're chucking, if you're yeah. chucking a nine-year-old in to an under 15s team just to make up numbers, then you'd be in trouble. If you're putting an under ni a nine-year-old into an under 15s team because they're six foot tall and a phenomenal athlete, that won't be a problem. But if it's literally just, gee, we've only got ten kids, let's shove Fred in. Then you've got a duty of care issue. That's why I said it's got to be on, on ability that they could that, that they're ready. And as I said, I was this big in, in as a twelve year old. I never grew again. I teach kids that are I teach the girls in particular are really tall these days. So it's whether physically as opposed to just whacking them in to make up numbers. So is that, as long as you're making a good duty of care, are you have you got the best interest of the child at heart? Is the coach needs the child Yeah, that's what I mean. So if you're putting them in for yeah, that's that's yeah, the process. Well, the parent can't put the kid on the field. The coach has to put the
was a question again. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm confused about because we've got some, you, know, you talk about keeping girls in country groups, and there's it's been some confusion at our club that when you get to under 12, you have to be the right age. So we've been having girls and some boys that are small that we want to keep down to under 11's team, but we haven't been able to because they're too old. And I don't know whether this is, it must be the truth. So if we're talking about trying to promote, girls staying and being in the friendship groups, then we need to be able to keep a 12-year-old in the under-11s team. But I know that we've been forced to move those up. Yeah. And that's a really big issue, is that you've got girls in grade six who are that age, yeah. and then they don't want to have to be going and playing with girls that are in year seven, they don't know. Yeah. So um, that's a really big issue at our club. That's so a, someone a made a comment about issue. double age Four groups before, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Was the comment about yeah. double age groups uh, it should be a double age groups or it should be single age groups? No, it's, it's another barrier. Yeah. But, yeah. but there's not enough kids, so... That's why there's yeah, double age groups. Right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. and Harry should make a um, point about that. I, I had issues this year with yeah. the competition scene because a lot of parents of girls were coming to me trying to uh, champion that in terms yeah. of, yeah, my girl wants to play with their friends, but their friends is one, a friend is one year younger yeah. and they can't play with them anymore and, and they're just going to leave the game, otherwise yeah. it happens, it happens all the yeah, time. Yeah, and it's, a big, it's, a, it's the transition point, that's when we lose them yeah. from yeah. primary school to high school. Mm -hmm. So if they can't play with their friend, well then well, I won't play anymore. That's so really it needs to be the FFB needs to really review those rules and we also had yeah. boys that wanted to stay in their teams yeah. as well. Yeah, no, good point. Um, there was other comments, questions? Yeah. Uh, we'll go there. Um, the um, junior team program there was Hampton um, who came up with the Mini Matildas um, program and I just want to share with everyone how successful yeah. that can be. And we run it on a Saturday afternoon, so it means the girls can do all their morning dance and play gymnastics yeah. and this. And then we do our um, six week program towards the end of the season, and the idea is they just get an introduction. We have 50 girls in this year, so we run it from age 7 to 12, um, and then at the end of the, so it's towards the end of the season, so we can hopefully keep them interested towards signing up. Yeah. yeah, and I think we've had other clubs, like Hampton, you're right, initiated it, and then other clubs around the area have gone, yeah, I think this is a great product. I know FFA is looking into a national introductory program um, as well, to be able to compete against the Oz Kicks as well and complement small sided. So, um, yeah, great. If you think back to the whiteboard, if you think back to the whiteboard of all the things that were listed there, and Anna Hari is going to type them up and, and send them around. There is some stuff, and you can see that Sal put, put some circles beside them, that you as clubs can actually do something about. <coughs> so we can't do a lot about um, the age group issue. We can't do a lot about it not being on telly, the women especially. But we can do stuff about how we pu publicise and market our club. I know the Auskick's experience, they had hardly any girls doing Auskick, and then one year they decided to put a girl on the poster. So not a girl's poster, a girl, a girl amongst the other kids on the poster and their numbers doubled in that one year just because all of a sudden you saw yourself there. Yeah. One other word of warning I will say to football though is I um, do a lot of work with netball which is obviously the, the female sport and they're targeting your girls because netball's very Anglo mm -hmm. and they're getting funding to become more multicultural. So not only are they going to steal your girls, they're going to steal your girls because soccer a team tends to be a more multicultural sport. So you've got even bigger challenges now because the other girls' sports are trying to get into the more traditional um, catchment groups of soccer. Yeah. So you need to constantly up your game. It's not just about getting any girl, it's about to strategically target them so you can get more awareness. But that boys' club issue can change, but it's up to you guys as the committee members to make that so happen. Change that one. How many um, hands up if you know what the total girl tournament is? Yeah, Ballarat. So this is what, 10 years old, this program? Yeah, initiated just by a group of parents in Ballarat. Two parents. Two parents, sorry. <laughs> Two parents, and it, uh, there's a bit, bit more of a committee now. on there now, but it's about 1,500 girls, sorry? It won't be going ahead next year. Oh, why's that? Well, what, what the world's about, um, because she's a man, Changing some oh, the grammar school's not available, is that? Yeah, yeah. and then also yeah. um, <coughs> the girls were coming and they were playing for the weekend, having a great time, they were there in their, you know, yeah. tops, 
but they weren't rec they weren't being able to recruit them into playing in yeah. the clubs. Yeah. They'd come and have a fantastic fun weekend, but it wasn't following through. Yeah, that, you're right. That's yeah. one of the big so issues that Large majority of the kids at those those uh, that tournament itself, which is fifteen hundred girls every yeah. year, go to it. A lot of them weren't even club players. No, uh, they were majority of them. School kids that just, this was the way girls played football. It was this tournament that happened in March every year. Mm -hmm. Because then the clubs, again in Ballarat specific, and I don't want to pick on them because they do a great job, but they weren't only there was only one one or two, I should say, two clubs in Ballarat which were proactive at recruiting girls. Yeah. I think Vic Park and North Ballarat. Yeah. From memory. And the others really didn't give a stuff. But and that's why that's the got, attitude. Yeah, that's yeah. why we've now formed a committee and yeah. somebody from each club to, to focus. Great. Yeah. I know Dave's, Dave Broadbent's working pretty hard on, yeah. on that with you guys, which is great, but it's not happening in Ballarat. Why can't it happen in another region? And as Sal said, it's not just about, you know, just getting the girls in and, and, and having a fun time, but it's the only way girls play soccer. Yeah. So think, uh, think about how do you want to play soccer? If you've got a daughter or a niece or a kid that lives up street, why don't they want to play? And I know we've talked a bit about the importance of mums, but to be honest, the research actually suggests that dads have the, better, the bigger role in when and how girls play sport. Particularly for the non-traditional female sports, the dads, if, you know when you go to the whole idea of you didn't, think you, you didn't even think about getting your girls to play your sport? It's that whole thing of, of course, my son's going to play football with me. It's getting the dads in the community to think the same. Of, of course, my daughter, why wouldn't me? Wouldn't I? And the biggest cultural shift we've seen in clubs is when guys, and it's my generation of parents, the first time ever their daughter gets told, no, you can't. And then the dad goes, why can't she? And then it starts to change. Yeah. So as a committee, have, that ha have the question, not which she can't or we can't or it's too hard or this is why it's not going to happen. Flip it. Why can't she? Yeah. Let's make it happen because it will. My club's down at Frankston and We've been going to the Tottenham Girls competition forever, virtually. Yep. It's probably the most fun activity there is for the girls to perform yep. all through pre-season. Yep. Uh, I can't think of a better good. tournament yes. to start off the season than that Tottenham Girls. Mm -hmm. But I didn't think that was that was uh, promoted by the FFB. No, no, it is promoted. It's just it's not run by the FFB. It was initiated by a local organising committee, a couple of parents, like they said, and yeah, they wanted to maintain that. it. So but it was something we like promoted. The the yeah, it's not run by FFB. It's not run by FFB. It's run locally. So the FFB actually involved. Can't they pick it up? Yeah, it's something the FFB has been talking to the local guys about. That it wanted to. The local guys that initiated it wanted to maintain ownership of it. And that, yeah, we needed yeah. to respect that. Yeah. But given it's got its issues for 2014, maybe it's something that FFE can continue. Um, and I've made that point to Anna Hari, I wrote it down, that maybe we should I talk should to them. Wonderful, wonderful yeah, I, I agree. I, I go there every year and I love, love seeing the atmosphere there. It's, yeah. it's a real girl event. It's fantastic. It's brilliant. Um, Any last yeah. questions or comments? I suppose I just want to because I'm very new to, to this, the soccer and so I've been nominated as um, the girls advocate, I suppose, for our club. Right. But the thing that, that I've noticed is that there's not a lot of, or well, the communication between um, FFV is really, it's all too late, not too late, but it doesn't give us enough time. Like on Friday, I got a notice to say that there's going to be a gala day in our area on the 12th of November. You know, the club needs to get involved and, you know, get the yeah. schools on board. Well, you know, the 12th of November is just around the corner. And I don't know whether it's coming through our club that we're slowing the process down or whether it's through yeah. FFV. But, you know, I rang three schools, which I didn't know that I would have to do. I thought that FFV would be the ones yeah. ringing the schools and, you know, getting them organised. And, you know, the school said, why would you do this in the court term? Yeah, exactly right. You yeah. know, I've got, we've got our program, talk to us in January, in February about something you want to do in November. Yeah. Don't talk to us in Well, November. a lot of school, when you are trying to tap into schools as, as clubs, the best time to talk to them about term one is in September when school calendars are, de are delivered to next year, developed for next year. So 
that's what I'd suggest. I, I don't know why that date is. It might have been that they've been negotiating that date locally for, with schools for some time. But if that's but, the case, that's fine. But why are yeah. we, as the only club in that area, told earlier? Yeah, work with us on it. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. I'd, I'd feed that back to Dave. I assume that came from yeah. Dave. Yeah, I'd feed that back to Dave. He just needs to look at it, I think. Yeah. Just to finish up, you do have um, a lot of resources in your little booklet. That um, female-friendly um, workbook is in there. It's tick boxes, so you can really do an audit and it will help you think about, well, why can't we do it or what can we do differently? I think if you come from any of these um, special projects areas or let, let's get from the point of, well, it should be pretty much exactly the same for both as your starting point and then figure out what you can and can't do. But there's no reason why you shouldn't have 50-50 Facility constraints obviously are the biggest issue that we've got. But just think about how can you, we are 50% of the population, there's a whole lot of people, there's talent. Your club might have the next Matilda, you can't have her if she's not got a club to play in as an under seven. Okay? Thank you all so much for your time for coming on a Sunday. Thank you, Salvin and Ahari. <laughs>